May this be our final session. We'll see. I don't remember how long this part of the game is going to be. But here's a long bosh. A dwarf, clothed in but a few straps of fur, puffs up his bared chest with every drag from his pipe. Come a long way to get some air, have you? What are you do doing here? Enjoying the fine weather, just a bit longer. He smiles, letting a cloud of smoke and frosted breath escape through his teeth. My mistress had business with the Andrites. We'll be off as soon as she's done at the Abbey. Meanwhile, I was told to stay put. You don't want any outsiders meandering about. She already put some kind of hex on me. Says I won't even remember any of this, but the copper's worth it. She says I'll wake up at home with a full coin purse, opposite of most of my mornings, so that had a certain appeal. Tell me about your mistress. Which one? He lets out a chuckle and slaps his chest. A reddening print blooms on his skin. Wish you were the fun kind. She's a gift bearer. Paid me well to guard her on the journey, though. I'm looking to get inside, aren't you now? Pulls the pipe away from his clenched teeth and points his long stem to the path ahead. As far as I know, straight this way. The middle path on the right with the ruined arch. They let you in, course. Andrites are none too friendly to their own. But to their own. The mistress went through the archway, spoke to some guards there, then headed on. He bites out on his pipe with a sour expression. They got eyes on the other paths, cast me dirty looks from afar when they passed this way. As if I'd stand here in plain view if I had some grand design of sneaking into their blazing church. And what's an abbey got that's worth hiding anyway? Monks? He grunts again and shakes his head and mutters something as odd if he were younger. Do you know of any other ways into the abbey? No, but it's an abbey, not a fortress. You can bet it's got holes like any fat old monster. Supply passages, escape routes. He shrugs as if this were a matter of course. I'd be lying if I said I'd never explored one uninvited when I was too young to know better or help myself to its relics. Let's just say if a certain war goddess has her way, I'll be living my next life as a dung roll bug. Are you helping me? He shrugs. You gotta look about you. Like you need it. And maybe there's something I don't like about this place, like it's hiding something. My younger days, it'd be me going in there. That will meet again. Any luck, my mistress will return soon. Hope you find what you're looking for. The rising tide. Well, I'm not in the mood for a bunch Hard of combat. Hard to imagine a whole sect living out here. But I guess that's the point. Old, who's there? I was just looking for the way out. Uh, Kauto is waiting for me. I'm the Tidebringer. How can I be sure? I'm here to replace the High Abbot. You do not let me pass, I will see to it that your bed is moved out here. We are in the final days of the Mequin's Tide, a time of transition for our church. My presence is no accident. The guard relaxes and appears relieved. Forgive my caution, we were told to expect you. The High Abbot awaits inside. Then our visitor is to be turned away, he said. It's the Andrites. Hey, we can take whatever we please. Decrease critical hit damage. What if I just never get crit ever? Why would I ever what I want to plan to get crit? Man, this could be a large number of people we were murdering if we had not uh, had the stats. Find out how to reach the reliquary. This area is forbidden. I'll be going then. Okay. You look pale, sister. Find someone to take your place. I'll stand watch. I'd hoped I was over this illness, but clearly not. I shall take your advice. Andra's blessings upon you, Tidebringer. Don't mind me, just tide bringing myself my own gifts. Four panels seem to be arranged as a story of some kind. Inspect the mural. First panel, onto the end. Second panel, Saman, the flood. Second, third panel, Disaman, the ebb. Fourth panel, the onto, the beginning. Door is sealed shut. Oh, 
Thought they let you through. You must be our visitor. The high habit awaits you inside, straight back. Andra's blessings upon you, Tidebringer. Okay, inside we are. You are our guest, I take it. You will find the abbot past the chamber of the fallen moon behind me. Giftbearer Beashka. The giftbearer holds her hand in her hand a gem the size of her fist. He draws a curved line in the air over it, then tosses it into the water. The gem hits the water and disappears from sight as though it had dissolved. Greetings. She ignores us. She stares at the surface of the pool. What happened to that gem? What gem? The gem you tossed into the pool. I remember no gem. You tossed it. How could you have forgotten? This pool is blessed by Andra, Tidebringer. I don't understand. She smiles placidly. All that belongs to Andra is forgotten, and all things forgotten belong to Andra. We already knew that. Why are we confused about that? We're familiar with the teachings of Andra. We know her way. Getting so mad at a little bit of religious mumble jumble that we go berserk. The other androids in the army are clad in drab functional garments. The Samawa seems dressed for an occasion. His robe is bright and glossy. His neck and arms are bedecked with jewelry. The symbols of his goddess are crowded into every available space. Ah, good, the conclave has elected a tidebringer after all. I begun to worry. He looks back up, noticing our company and nods. And they took my advice in providing you an escort. Very good. I am sorry I could not make your journey easier. I am Kyoto, the High Abbot. Came as soon as I could. And just in time, the Mequin's tide is nearly past its peak. Much longer, and we'd have had to wait another year. The rules of the Rising are quite clear on that, unfortunately. When you are ready, we'll begin with the recitation. The Conclave mentioned something about a reliquary. Yes, of course. I would not pass my station to you without passing that knowledge as well. It is the Abbey's most sacred chamber. When the Rising is complete, I will take you there myself. In fact, the ritual demands it. About the recitation. <laughs> you seem nervous. The Conclave chose you for a reason. For a devout follower of Andra, the answers will flow naturally to you. I remember my own rising. The Conclave sent me on the same exhausting journey. When it came time for the recitation, I could not remember a word. But it all came back in time. A goddess smiles upon the forgetful. He taps a large golden ring with a wave insignia as though it were proof. Our library is open to you as of the grounds outside. There is a beautiful mural out there that you should see if you haven't yet. And you may, of course, speak with the gift bearers here if it helps your recollection. Take the time and examine these things before your recitation. But if I fail, do not be afraid to fail. A lapse here or there is to be expected. But do take care in your work. My patience has its limits. How did you become the High Abbot? I was elected by the Conclave as you were, but you already knew that much. It was unexpected. The others were more accomplished. I was merely a scholar. But they each had their faiths called into question. No one could find cause to doubt mine. He smiles proudly, exposing for the first time yellowed, worn teeth. He seems conscious of our gaze and quickly hides them again. It was such an honor to become one of Andra's most trusted service. Servants. It was hardly a choice at all. Farewell. Uh, let's just try it. Why not? We can begin the recitation. Very good. We shall commence the rising. First is Antu, last is the Antu, for the tide comes at the end and leaves at the beginning. I am Dizman, the Ebb, who comes this way. I am Saman, the Flood. Blessed be Saman, that washes over the shore and brings the end. Blessed be Dizaman, that returns to the sea and leaves behind the beginning. A gift-bearer comes to Dizaman and asks him to bear his burdens away. What tokens do you offer, gift-bearer? I give myself, for a gift-bearer has no other tokens to offer. The token is received in Andra's name. Tell me of your burdens. I have none, for all that belongs to Andra is forgotten. In Andra's embrace, our burdens are lifted. Kyoto appears pleased. He nods. Manea sighs with relief. The Tidebringer shows himself worthy of his charge. Your purpose here, Tidebringer, is to perform the ceremony of the Rising, is the transition of one phase of service to the next. How much longer is this going to be? My joints are resting. On the level beneath us in the halls of silence, our low-tide brothers and sisters have lived for many years, sealed by their own will. It is time for them to be relieved of service, for the high-tide brothers and sisters here to take their place. In the halls below you will find a relic, Andra's witness, 
an aspergillum for dispensing holy water, but also something more. It is set into a device that operates, atop a flight of steps. The device will flood the halls of silence. This is the rising. Won't the people down there drown? It is the will of Andra. Every monk assigned to the abbey understands and accepts this. He smooths back his thick stalks of hair with one hand. A gray strand sticks to his palm. He frowns at it, then looks back up and continues. The monks here have all served as gift bearers. We bear away people's most painful memories, and always a part of them remains with us. He's right about that much, Menea shrugs at us. In the halls of silence, memory itself fragments until it is no more. The halls are a reprieve from a gift bearer's burden. Nods. In the end, the halls take all memory. But the process takes a toll, as you might imagine. After many years, when the process is complete, the rising is performed to give final peace to those who dwell there. This is your charge. Dying immediately seems preferable to losing all memory in the halls of silence only to drown later. Don't say that. <laughs> You're supposed to be an Andrite. It goes beyond that. It is about duty as well. The Abbey is one of Andra's most guarded secrets. Death is no guarantee our knowledge will fade safely. It is necessary that the memories of this place be washed away. Do this in Andra's service. Yamawa notices an age spot on his arm as he gestures. He licks a finger and rubs at it like a smudge. There's so much stage business in this game. What do I have to do when the rising is complete? The high tide is to replace the low and stand vigil in the halls of silence until the next rising. When you have completed the rising, bring Andra's witness to me here. I will show you the last of what you need to know. When I have Andra's witness, what do I do with it? The device it operates is a simple valve mechanism. It will be clear to you when you see it. I will return when the rising is complete. To reach your destination, you will need to know the sign of the tide, which is kept only by the High Abbot. It said that it is the first knowledge lost when the Abbot joins the low tide in the halls of silence. Watch carefully. Kanto contorts his fingers with his right hand into a particular curl shape. And with his left, he traces an arc from center to end simultaneously with his index and little fingers. I trust you will perform your duty, Tidebringer. Um, I hope I was paying attention. It smells like an ocean breeze. We've got to be close. They call out sometimes. Even the guards below think it's strange. You may enter, Tidebringer. Farandra most, Farandra most like, they surely long for her embrace. It's here, the salt well. In the room is a pool. It's small, but deep enough we can't see the bottom. The glassy surface almost looks frozen. So does Manea. She stands rooted in place, staring at it. You know, I thought it'd be bigger. It looks deep, anyway. Gift bearers say the heaviest regrets and greatest sorrows get left here. But it better be, she peers in. And I thought you'd be diving in by now. She makes a little noise of frustration in the back of her throat. You know how when you've been thinking about something so long you're worried what you finally get it? It won't be what you expected. She tugs at one of her bracelets. I mean, for all we know, this thing's just filled with leeches. You're stalling. Don't remind me. You were never liable for the massacre, you remember. Let go of your guilt. Your memory of the massacre has shaped you. Discarding it may change more than you intend. Memory is a penance... But if your memory of the massacre is prevented from committing a crime, your suffering helps no one. Forget the massacre so that you can have peace. The problem has never been your memory. It's the part of your soul that led you to massacre those people. Whew. Eh. Your suffering helps no one. Forget the massacre. She lets out a long, slow breath. You're right. Okay. Here goes. She shakes her arms and legs out with a jingling of metal. Striding forward, she steps into the pool. Ooh, that's cold. She convulses with a sudden shiver, rattling her jewelry. She descends the steps until she's standing in water up to her neck. Do you feel anything? Hey, what year is it? Oh, very funny. She splashes frigid water in our direction. This is the right pool, isn't it? She frowns and cranes her neck around the room. This is a temple to Andra. Perhaps you need to give something up. Her eyes go wide and she snaps her fingers. I've got it. She digs through a pack and produces a thick bundle of cloth bound with leather. It's the same one we glimpsed earlier. She snaps the leather cords and unrolls the cloth, revealing a wine bottle. Took this from the Marchesso's cellar the night I awakened, then saving it for a special occasion. Maneha, right, 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 the awakening. Cradles the bottle and brushes dust from the green glass. 
Heaving a sigh, she heaves it by the neck and swings and smashes it against the steps. Menea drops the rest of the broken bottle into the pool where it spirals into the depths. Meanwhile, the wine has formed a roiling, bloody cloud in the water. It spreads its long, swirling tendrils. Ooh! The surface of the pool ripples when Menea paddles the spreading cloud. Crimson tentacles erupt from it, writhing and reaching. Menea grasps as one wraps around her arm. Hey, she's in trouble. Watch out. Wait. Another wine-colored tentacle wraps around her head. She shouts and it pulls her under. Menea disappears into the pool. We can't see anything through the crimson murk, except for the blossoming cloud of wine. The waters look perfectly still again. Seconds crawl by. We gotta go in after her. Did that thing come from the bottle or the pool? Allow me to retrieve her. I will fight this wine tentacle monster. At last, bubbles break the surface. Maneha emerges, gasping and shivering. Her face is strangely slack and her eyes are bloodshot. You all right? She thinks about this for a moment. She nods. She climbs out of the steps and out of the salt well. As she does, the reddish color dissipates from the water, leaving only the glassy, clear surface and the unfathomable depths below. What do you remember? She squints, thinking. Water pools at her feet. I remember running, but I don't remember what chased me. I remember fear, but I don't remember what scared me. She looks back at the salt well. I gave something up, but I don't remember why. How do you feel? She tilts her head to one side and wiggles a finger in her ear until a spurt of water streams out. I'll feel better after a glass of wine. Something drips onto the floor. She holds her right arm up and looks at the trickle of blood running from a cut in her hand. She takes the folded cloth, the one she'd wrapped the wine bottle in from the floor, and staunches the bleeding. Clean conscious, she jerks her head toward the exit. Well, what's talking to her like now? What she got for me? Have you been doing since the salt well? She laughs. I know that look. You're worried I've lost more than a few bad dreams. It's strange, knowing my life's been shaped by something I don't remember. She tilts her head to one side, thinking. But I finally feel like I can look forward instead of back. She smiles at that thought. Now I just have to figure out what I'm looking forward to. Normal. Normal. She's fine. And our protagonist levels up first. He can't even buy a skill. He gets to buy a level four power. Appropriate. Sure. Seven damage reduction stolen for 27 seconds is pretty good. Mind Lance, just a huge fucking attack. 56 to 67 is pretty big, but... Uh, 10 points stolen from a random attribute, let's just take body attunement. Taking seven damage reduction away is good. Um, greater focus, plus 10 max focus, as if... We could take Rhymer's Summon here at the very end. Weapon focus, we've already got this one. We took Sniper, right? Sanctifier. Penetrating Shot. That's pretty good. Reduces range attack speed and increases DR bypass. I'm not sure. Hmm. Oh, plus 15 interrupt all the time, huh? Oh, is there a Dragon Hunter? Vessel, Ghost Hunter, Spirit, Primordial, Beast. Oh, dragons are beasts. Beasts there. The Kraken might also be a beast. Hell yes. We've got a dragon still to kill. Alright. We don't really need to thoroughly explore this place. I mean... Oops. Hope none of those were important. Abaddon's hands, correspondences of the gift bringer Eden. The erosion calendar. What is this? The moons of Aora. Look up into the night sky and you'll see the moons Belaf the moon Belafa. Ubiquitous and persistent, she remains forever in view, but also forever out of reach. What many people do not know, however, is that our world is actually orbited by two moons. Belafa and Kalda. Belafa. Hanging low and large in the sky, Belafa travels swiftly in her race around the world, completing an orbit in about 18 days. 
This proximity and speed can cause extreme tide conditions in some areas, making the seas shift so quickly and rise so high that there are some beautiful coastal areas that are virtually uninhabitable for a good portion of the year. Before we learn the truth behind the cause of the tides, legend held that Andra, the goddess of the sea, was in love with the moon, and when she saw it in the sky, the tides, great waves, and violent storms that happened were her attempts to reach it. This is why the moon is formally called Senbalafa, or Andranbalafa, the beloved, or Andra's beloved. Kaolda. 315 years ago, the Grand Empire of Velia suffered some terrible storms and terrifyingly high and low tides. Records show the same thing was happening in the Adir Empire, and that several new Adiran colonies along the Deerwood coast were completely destroyed by storms and high tides that engulfed the settlements. At the time, during an eclipse, Glenfath and astronomers spotted something small orbiting near the edge of Balafa. After much study, they realized it was a small satellite with an extremely irregular orbit. They called it Kaldadeb, or the Black Runner. Since it is smaller than Balafa, it doesn't have much effect on the world, but when it aligns with Balafa's orbit, it wreaks havoc on the tides and weather everywhere. This happens with an erratic frequency and severity, and have been dubbed the Lover's Tides. Kalda has ever been rolled into the Andra myth, and when they are both in sight, her desire to reach them is increased tenfold, which is what causes the terrible weather. There's, uh... Moons are important, folks. Moons matter. Moons matter. Tides and moons... We have all heard the legends of Andra and Sen Balafa, and the explanation that the goddess's love for the moon causes the tides, and as men and women of science we know this to be but a shadow of truth. Yet there is another myth that we have been quicker to dismiss, and I wonder if it does not merit further explanation. Andrites tell of a smaller moon, Yoni Brother, that the goddess supposedly pulled from the sky in an earlier age. And while such a thing seems impossible, for Yoni Brother still roams the skies above, it is true that explorers in the far reaches have found mineral fragments that do not naturally occur on any known continent in Aora. Furthermore, naturalists in Adir Rawatai and the Deerwood have observed the remains of ancient ocean life many miles inland. Such a thing would only be possible if Aora's oceans had once been larger, or, as I here propose, if a catastrophic flood had once washed over the continents. While few phenomena would f cause a flood of this magnitude, a large body falling into the seas just might do the trick. In these pages I will explain how some force of nature, if not an amorous goddess, would have pulled a small moon into Aora millennia ago. Moons, huh? Moons, moons. Funny old things, moons. Uh, probably just want to go downstairs, right? At all? This area is forbidden. Kyoto granted me passage to walk freely, so it begins. You may continue, Tidebringer. Be warned, the low tide have been in the halls of silence for a long time. Their brines are not sound. Your presence may provoke them. We're really going to have to fight our way through these dudes? Mind your center. You always knew this time would come. I've seen the other side, brother. I'll find its waters again, warm and soothing. Mm. Getting texts from a dude who wants to get fucked. Anyway, massive coppery bones encased under the ice seem to be part of the hips of a giant skeleton. It's another... Oh, if I see max endurance. Okay. Make sure they receive extra. I'll not let them fall into the goddess's embrace with empty stomachs. Their supplies are bountiful, sister. I have seen to it. And now they're all going to be drowned. Wasteful. Giant skeleton hip. Sure. Odina Fergust. Oh, a key. You've crested key. Sure. We're going to be level 16, one and all, very soon, so we won't even need to pick locks anymore. I guess we're looking for this door over here? Man, I'm so glad we have double speed. Or quadruple speed, or whatever the additional speed is. Uh, okay, I guess that wasn't what we were looking for. Where's what we're looking for? Well, that's interesting. You have to use food items before combat. You can't use them in combat. This looks like what we're looking for. Unlock with wave crested key. Let me through the low tide. 
Why, no you. The woman drags her fingers in the wall, cringing when her cracked nails scratch the stone. Hmm. The door is sealed shut. Is this where you can fight the Kraken? What was that ring? Pool of the Anointed. Hovering over a skeleton half trapped in ice, a faint trace of essence lingers in the cold air of the cavern. Reach out to the essence. We let our soul envelop the essence. Memories spread in a thin mist under us, dim and torn, their scattered fragments floating like motes of dust in the twilight. We're walking into an oblong chamber. The stones of its underground walls glisten, still wet from the floodwaters. A hand clasps on our shoulder. We hear a whisper. Arthrek, I don't want to look. The memory vanishes, and now all we see is a slab of stone. We're staring at it just inches away from the wall. Our fingers trace, trace circles on it, peeking into the moss that clings on its weathered surface. We're not sure how long we've been touching it. Perhaps we've always been. A scream jolts us. Its echoes thunder throughout the halls. Our ears hurt, a pain that digs deep, burrowing into our head like a twisted dagger. We run. Others run. We don't know them. We can't remember them. But somehow we take comfort in their presence. Yes, they will help you with the pain. The noise will kill it. The anger of the memory subsides, and now we're sitting down on steps carved on rock. Dozens of skeletons lie below beneath frozen water. Their jaws hang open, silent. Hey, what's that? A low rumble, gargling, growling, deafening. We snap our head to the side in anguish and see it. The water rushing down the halls, pushing us in a torrent of white foam. We fall, our mouth opens to shut, to shout, but our screams are muffled as it fills with water. Uh, so are they not hollowed out by the time they're down here, or what? Juggernaut. Faster when you're healthy, more interrupt when you're damaged. I see a secret way in. Spiders! What are you doing, ma'am? Get shooting. Why for is the team not shooting? Uh, not seeking targets. Legs! Despite the icy sheen that covers these webs, their threads gently vibrate at the slightest disturbance. Oh, that spider is outside of time. Cannot be reached. I assume this is a way out. Cliffs of the Abbey, not where we need to be. Lever. No, it hurts. Forgive, goddess, make it stop. Well, this is horrible. So much for thee, their holy death. If we had uh, come in here alone and stealthed through. Not much of a life down here, is it? Who's there? Hello. It's a guy. Lots of water in here. Monks often live in solitude. But here, instead of growth, I sense unraveling. Laurentis. Tufts of downy gray hair sprout from the back of this man's scalp-like shrubs. His lower lip curls inward over a row of teeth that appear to have mostly fallen out, and a musty odor hangs about him like a fog. Is that you, Edith? I... I thought I'd lost you. I see this man's mind shattered, crumbling even as we stand here. I called for you. I wanted to search, but the blizzard lasted days. I'm... I'm so sorry. He extends a hand in a gesture of apology, but then the fingers curl and he draws it back. Squints as if trying to see us better. But wait. I did find you. When the thaw finally came, I saw you. Rigid. Frozen. Cannot be Edith. No, we are... in the Abbey. 
gift bearers, and you, you must be the tide bringer. Ah, oh, correct, I am the tide bringer. Then listen well, tide bringer. Kauto knows that d- does not know what he asks. Nor did I when I performed the tide bringer's duties so long ago. The halls of silence they take our minds, memory by memory. It would be peaceful, we were told, like going to sleep. Look around you. We, the low tide, who have been sealed down here all these many years, do we seem at peace to you? We are lost, terrified. What is it you want from me? There is a relic, an aspergillum. It was called, what is it? Well, it doesn't matter. It controls the flood waters, but also the outer floodgates. Andra's Witness, that is the name. It is down here, but I don't recall how to reach it. The High Abbot knows. You could find out from him. You could set us free. Open the gates. We would leave in peace and finish our lives in dignity. Are you certain it's wise to release the low tide in this condition? We are all so old now. There is little damage we could do in this state. I don't know. We had this old fellow in Gilded Vale. Looked harmless. Couldn't talk. But he'd bite you if you tried to steal a stake when no one was looking. Once we are free of this place, we will be able to make memories again. The confusion and paranoia will pass. The order attacked me. Few of us still know friend from foe. I may be the only one left who can still speak for us. They are peaceful in their hearts. It is this place. It has confused and agitated them. Please forgive them. Oh, that's good. I ought to try that one next time I get nabbed. I'll see what I can do. He nods absently. Use the door behind me. Safely that way. Sure. Oh no, we need to murder more of them. I would have preferred to not murder you. Set you free. An acrid and pungent smell climbs up from the depths of this pit. I'm the hottest person currently trapped in this pit. Beyond the door, you catch glimpses of shapes in the darkness, wails and whispers, faint and erratic echo from within the sealed halls. The door appears to be barred from the inside. It does not budge. Oh no! Oh no! No, I don't want to kill a bunch of them. Okay, let's try to be sneaky. Of course, if there's an area transition, it's going to be harder, but still doable. He just patrols, so. Different scenes of an ocean shoreline are carved into four stone panels, arranged almost haphazardly at different heights along a network of rails. Ah, we know what this is. Uh. What is it? Well, we saw... It doesn't have their names. How about Flourishing City? Flies without resistance and locks into place. City in flames. Tidal wave. And barren shore. No? Damn it. Flourishing City. City in flames. What if we press the button now? Oh, they went back. All right. Barren shore. Tidal wave. Oh no, it's coming to the city in flames. Hmm. I swear we already got this right. Surely it should be... The city, city in flames, tidal wave, then barren shore, right? City, city in flames, tidal wave, then barren shore. That's not it. Flourishing city, city in flames, tidal wave. Now press the button, now they reverts. Barren shore, flourishing city, city in flames, and then tidal wave. No, I don't. 
understand the logic of this then. Okay, so we're just seeing it in the wrong position. So first is the city in flames. And then it's the tidal wave. And then it's the barren shore. And then it's the flourishing city. There we go. Perform the sign of the tide on the hidden carving. Uh-oh. Did we just call it the flood? We didn't want to do that, though. That was not our plan. We were going to help these poor fools. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Um, just gonna zap these guys. Did we miss the opportunity to save them by doing that? That's what I want to know. Or... Can we still set them free? here. Oh yeah. One of the rising wave, the other of an open gate. Open gate. Hey, party teleported over here. Nice. I guess this was to make sure that even if you slaughtered everyone, there would still be some more kicking around. What? Stop them. Oh no, our brethren, do not harm them. Laughter, crying, and cheers. Alarms resonate. With a click, the machine releases its hold of the strange rod. We pack the vessel away. Use Andra's witness to enter the reliquary. Where is the reliquary? Your heart is weak to let them escape their trial. Do not expect me to do the same for you, Durance. Be a fly on the wall when they reach Stalwart. It did them no good to remain confined in this place. I hope that freedom suits them better. Andra's tides. Here's hoping the cold gets them before they reach a town. Oof. We spared as many as we could. Or should we go back and talk to the dude? Still gonna be here. Oh. You are free. You didn't have to do that. You could have lived. Looks like he left. Very well. Um, should we go back up and talk to the abbot? So where is the reliquary? Use the Andra's witness to enter without Kyoto's help. But what is the reliquary? What is it? I'm a little, uh... Okay, this is, we... A man named Koto knew how to call up the monster's army. He mentioned it would be done in the reliquary. We just need to find that somewhere around here. I guess it's here. Whoa. The sacred halls unsealed. Sacrilege. Well, what was happening down there was sacrilege. It was not what you claimed. You do not know what you do. Andrite Crescent Ward. We're gonna murder a bunch of religious people. Listen, they're religious wrong. Hardly unusual. Why is no one finding new targets? Has everyone forgotten their auto attack aggressive? Why did that fall off? Aggressive. 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 Everyone forgot. I hope it's not because I turned off the AI that they all just had their settings reset. Because I might want to turn off AI again without that happening. 
dice. Well, you were doing horrible stuff here. I, I gotta say, locking those people in the basement, not having any interest in uh, whether what you claimed was going on was going on. I'm not sure I can stand by Andra's conduct here in the monastery. Oh, they left. Gonna meet us in the courtyard? I wonder if the reliquary... I mean, I don't feel the need to kill all of them or anything. Exterminationist program here against the Andrites. We can go the least murderous path. Why are we exploring? We don't need to explore. We don't need to do that. We can simply bustle our way out. I bet that the way we're looking for is that way we were barred entry before. Well, we could have fought our way in there, couldn't we? Giant skeleton's rib cage. It's a big skeleton. I wonder who around here was big. The halls of presence, the passages of Andra. Giant skeleton's leg. Who around here was big? Halls of silence. Was that just... No, that's just over there. Well, where's the reliquary, my dude? I just need to know. Then Halls of presence again. Giant skeleton's hand. Ice has been built upon every space between the bones of this skeletal hand, forming a slippery incline to the jagged cliffs below. Um... Seemed like y'all were ready to... Uh, passages of Andra. Oh yeah, that's just the... The tablets. Um... Oh, it's back there, probably. There we go. This looks to me like it's going to be a confrontation space. Although they lock the door behind themselves. Maybe not. A level. Journal of the High Abbot. This volume appears to serve many functions. There are notes in it detailing schedules and routines in the Abbey. There are favorite passages from Andrite texts annotated with personal insights. There are also descriptions of dreams. Many seem purely symbolic, but one entry is of interest. It has been long since I dreamt of my rising. Yet now, with another rising soon upon us, this is the fifth time in a week. Perhaps channeled here, I can put it to rest. I'm walking through the halls of silence. I feel eyes on me from all sides. Angry, vengeful eyes. I arrange the panels and curl my hands into the side of the tide. The right is the wave. The left, tracing the crescent moon with the two outer fingers. The way opens to me. I climb the steps and Andra's witness is installed there, the old Esper Gillum to operate the valves. I use it like a lever and the water rises. There are angry shouts, and when I cover my ears, they are louder still. The waters continue upward, far past where it should. I climb as high as I can, but I feel it icy on my feet. Then it is over my head, and I cannot breathe. Suddenly I am outside the reliquary, looking at the veil of tears. The witness is in my hand, and the veil parts for it. I step through, to the one place in the abbey I feel protected. Only when I pass inside, I come out in total darkness. I call for help. I'm shouting, screaming for help. There is no answer. I stop. I sit there in the dark, waiting for what seems like ages, and then realize I don't know who I am. Well, where is the reliquary in this veil of tears? That's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. The weird... Thing. That was just an alternate way for us to get some information. That's useful. Is the reliquary over on the western side? Is it through the chamber of the fallen moon? Oh, hello.
Our girl got swooshed. I guess all the Andrides do have to die after all. Level ups all around. I stunned my friend. My bad. How long is he stunned? 20 seconds. <laughs> I used recover on him. Control R. Brought him back to life. The halls of silence. The halls of silence. Just where the fuck is the reliquary? And this is the ramparts of the Abbey. Is it out this way? Oh, this might be it. Maybe? Hang on. Oh. Where the fuck is it? Come on. Aha! The reliquary. Right over here. Sorry to the souls that we could not spare. You'll find better... better. You won't meet me next time around the wheel. Big skeleton. Big skeleton. You've made a grave mistake. I will correct it in Andra's name. No. This was the right call. Put everyone on their ass. And now, why don't you... Not yet. Grant your cipher blades to him. Oh, the devil. Getting owned. Yes, empower our cipher. Oof. He ceased to be pretty hard. Robes of the Tidebringer, exceptional. Friends martyr on unconscious. Friends attack faster. Um Got some fancy pants. Fine monk outfit. Spell defense. Andrite Titleist mask. That's a cool mask. I like that mask. Not all that well equipped were you. Oh, nope, that's just another fine morning star. Uh why don't we nap? Why don't we level up? 16. Weapon Mastery Ruffian. We're using a sword now. Damn it. Sure, take it. Why not? Durant. He's gonna get another level 4 spell that he has as a. Um, Brilliant Radiance? Aspirant's Mark, Rhymer's Summon. How about the Rhymer's Summon? Just give him that, why not? I need to give people that. The Devil. Uh, offense. Crossbow. Crossbow. The water wall. Water flows upward from the thin slit that cuts along the tiles of the floor. The water swells and condenses when touched, forming an elastic barrier that resists any attempt to cross it. But we have the relic. Yeah. Oosh.
big skeleton. Fine brigandine. I used to have this big hound, used to dig her bones. He'd be real excited right now. A goddess who buys faith by hiding secrets is sure to have a few of her own. You should not be surprised. Is this what the abbey was built to hide? I knew this abbey was a secret, but I had no idea. Big Skeletal. Exceptional scale armor. Lodged between rows of crystalline rock, a large fragment of metal protrudes. Looks as though it might be possible to pry loose, pull out the metal fragment. At our touch, the splinter of metal begins to glow orange. Heat surges up our hands and arms and envelops us with such intensity we feel as though we're melting down. The heat spreads to the world around us, turning it orange and then yellow and then white. The ground, the sky, everything around us drips in molten globs and begins to shape beneath us as if we are an invisible mold. We and the shard are the last thing to melt and fall, and our addition to the molten pool completes the shape of an immense hammer. The metal cools as quickly as it had heated. The handle is gripped now by two great leathery hands, and the hammer is cocked back over a shoulder as broad and mottled as a hilltop. The wielder whirls around and heaves the hammer, and we are flying upward for what seems like ages with the airless blackness above. As we spin, we catch glimpses of a rock large enough to be a moon. It is close, far too close to the world. The force of the impact shatters hammer and stone alike. The rock is redirected outward, but a section from the front face is cleaved off and begins to fall, splintering apart at the cracks. In a hundred thousand fragments blossoming outward in all directions, debris showers the atmosphere, trailing smoke and fire. Below, land and sea are far off, but gradually rising up. Look to the sea. The largest of the fragments, wide as a city, barrels downward in a fiery cocoon. Its size reduces as the edges immolate, but it won't burn up in time. It lands silently in the distant ocean, sending a column of water skyward and radiating ripples that spread like wrinkles in fabric. Then the sound comes tearing up through the sky. It sounds like thunder. Look to the land. Features are becoming clearer by the moment as we streak toward the earth. We lodge an enormous boulder, falling among other smaller fragments that heat and burst around us on all sides. Beneath us, snow-capped mountains rise up, dotted here and there by cities of stone and Adra. The impact will be the destruction of all of them. The shadow of our rock fragment is visible now, getting larger by the second. We are moments away from striking the ground when a massive shape throws itself into our path. The last thing we hear sounds like another rumbling impact, but that isn't what it is. A chuckle, relieved, breathless. We hear two words. Made it. Everything goes dark. We open our eyes. The metal hammer fragment has come free, and we now hold it in our hands. It is warm to the touch. The air around us is suddenly turbulent and spiteful. A cold, damp wind whips our face. Salt crystals collect in our nostrils and the creases of our eyes. The floor below us becomes blue-gray and glassy, churning and rolling. And when we fall, we crash through water. Violent waves hurl and spin us. Something slithers around our ankles. Thus, with great strength, drags us down into salty depths. I will last gleefully. This is very good. When the pulling stops, we're hovering at the center of an endless blue abyss. We can see neither surface nor floor. We seem to be facing downward, but there's no way to be sure. A voice sounds from everywhere at once. The immense pressure wave of each utterance sends us reeling. Deceitful wretch, brave robber, you who dig for that which you did not bury speak. Explain yourself and be judged. I seek a means of defeating an army that threatens my lands. You seek what is mine, what was rightfully lost. The outburst propels us, sending us end over end. Your actions speak for themselves. The battery opened, the forge ignited. 
You set free souls that hid from me, that stole from me and evaded my judgment. The dwarves sealed their own fate. The forge was meant to be forgotten. And now here you are again, denying peace to the buried. The turbulence around us calms. Silt settles like a slow exhalation and the vast, dark seascape beyond the murk fades in. Rays of light trickle down from far above and onto green gold columns of kelp that rise from the depths and sway back and forth in the current. Fish and mollusks patrol them in groups of hundreds and thousands. The nearest pass us with watchful eyes. You mean the forge is meant to be forgotten? It was never meant for mortal use. Such power, such truths lie within it. It can bring only ruin. When the Parkrunin came to the White March, they were peaceful. They shared common beliefs and purpose. Their visions for the forge tore them apart. You have seen this for yourself. They would have destroyed themselves in the end. How convenient that we'll never know. You need only look to the history of your own civilization for assurance. How many wars and fallen empires might have been averted if only their leaders could forget the objects of their ambition? I mourn the loss of the Pargrunin. Misfortune brought them here. They did not deserve to end so soon. What does it matter if something is remembered or forgotten? In the past, in either case. Memories of the spirits of the past, who of all people should know their sway on the present watcher. What's that supposed to mean? They're ours to bear whether we care or not. Great, more spirits. Um, They're ours to bear whether we care or not. Mortals measure their worth of their lives in memory. Who will remember me? How long until I am forgotten? Memory governs every thought, informs every choice. It can fuel passion, understanding, love. Or it can create obsession. Madness. You have seen it plague many souls in your travels. Consider the old watcher who inherited unspeakable crimes from birth. Or the young woman who committed herself to Brackenbury for love of things she remembered she had. Or the Glanfathen boy for whom an old medallion was worth more than all the fruits of his labors. Or the former crucible knight whose political embarrassment embittered him against the organization whose ideals he treasured above all. They could be free of their burdens. If only they could forget. Their burdens exist for a reason. Why should they be allowed to forget? Many such people gain these burdens through no fault of their own. Others act to redeem themselves only to find their memories will not forgive them. The fires of cold morn died long ago. Yet vengeance still burns in this construct's mind. What is vengeance but a fire fueled by memory that consumes the soul? One way to kill time? Cold morn is not but a memory now. If it no longer intruded on her thoughts, no longer haunted her dreams, she could live a life of her choosing. She's endured things that no one should have to remember. Cold morn is part of her identity now. It gives her purpose. I shudder to think what that might entail. Let's be cute. Her life would have been far different. Of that, there can be little doubt. But I would lose my favorite conversation starter. The light filtering down from the surface seems to focus on Manea. You cast your troubling memories aside when you had the opportunity, and you have found the peace you sought. It's funny. I remember feeling bad, but I don't remember why. It's like having scars for wounds you don't remember. As long as they don't reopen one day, I can live with that. The source of those wounds is long gone. The memory was all that could cause you harm. I would leave my own memories behind if I could. They haunt me whether or not I remember them. There was value in the memory despite the harm. Responsibility runs deeper than memory. Um, responsibility is another word for guilt. For those who have made amends or were born with the burden of others, should they not be freed? Even when problems have run their course, memory can be the stone that sinks you into the abyss. Be that as it may, I must reject your moral paradigm because it engenders an incomplete conception of the good that fails to consider the importance of testing the soul. Hmm, indeed. And what has led you to conclude you know better than a god, mortal? Your supposition that peace of mind is tantamount to the overall good is a flawed premise. Empirically, we know that struggle and inner turmoil strengthen the soul as often as they strangle it. Zawa nods appreciatively. My master could not have said it better. That hardly sounds like an improvement on inner peace. Is that the extent of your argument? No, actually. 
I submit to you, excuse me, that life is a framework to test the soul, and that an untested soul wizard withers from disuse. Consequently, it is better to test the soul in order that it should thrive. If it breaks, it is no worse off than if it were not tested at all. Durant's chortles. There may be hope for you yet, Watcher. Your reasoning is interesting, mortal. Perhaps there is something to it. But it is not my will to simply do good. Those broken souls that fail your test, those are the ones I love most, for no other god will have them. What small mercies they ask of me, I will always grant. Was there something else, mortal? What are the bones of one god doing sealed in the temple of another? Do not play coy with a god, Watcher. I know you have seen his death. I feel it whenever a forgotten thing is taken from me. Abidon did not deserve to die here. This place, it was the least I could do to give his remains some privacy. The least you could do. The least I could do for ending his life. Light drains from our surroundings. The kelp forest becomes a copse of black tendrils, stark and twisted as regret. I called the moon down to me. He only brought there. It was against his wishes. He would listen to he would not listen to reason. He would not listen to me. In his madness, he splintered the moon, but it was not enough. The greatest of the fragments still fell toward that which he would protect. In the end, he took position where it would fall, and absorbed the impact himself. I thought Belefa and Kaldo were the moons. Yona Brathir is their smaller sibling, tiny next to them. Small enough that the world would survive its impact. But why the temple? Why the secrecy? That time has been forgotten now, and so his death belongs to me. Everything he knew before the impact. But you slew another god. Surely the other gods must know this. Surely Abidon must know. Current surges through the kelp bed, pushing each plant sideways like saplings in a hurricane, and propelling us backward amidst a torrent of wayward fish. No. He cannot know. He must never know. Understand, he was not always as he is now. His body was not all he left behind. He was devoted to progress and industry from the beginning, but so too he was devoted to preservation. In those times he would let nothing go. Nothing could be forgotten. His will was iron long before his body. Preservation. So that was why he went so far to oppose you. We agreed long ago, all of us, not to alter the course of Kith civilization, not directly, unless there were no other choice. But in this matter there was no other choice. He understood that as well as anyone. It was for duty that he opposed it. I would have stopped it if I could, but by then it was too late. What was it he was trying to preserve? Time has finished much of what I started. I cannot tell you that, mortal for fear of undoing all its costly work. You make it sound as if you were the sane one. The other gods knew what had to be done, but they lacked the will to go through with it. Even gods have their attachments. To erase all knowledge of such a grand thing required unthinkable devastation. Eastern reach. Dead fire. Mine was the only solution. When I called down Yoni Brother, they remained silent. The Navi Don. Though it was for the best. But he tried to stop it all the same. Perhaps deep down I knew he would. I should have expected it. I could have stopped it. I want to ask you about something else. Why did you pull down Yoni Brother? The great conundrum of a god is how close to become with your subjects. Too far and they lose hope. Too close and your own judgment fails. I guess dropping a rock on their heads is one way to fix that. Civilizations are meant to ebb and flow. Allow them to persist for too long in power or knowledge and you invite catastrophe. There was a time when we let our sympathies get the better of us, when memories were allowed to persist that should have been washed away. The other gods could not be moved to act. I did what had to be done without them. You're talking about the Angwithans. I speak of what is forgotten. I failed that day, but my purpose was achieved in the end. I will not dredge up the memory to satisfy idle curiosity. The army that destroyed the dwarves, the eyeless, are they yours? What the world casts aside I take into my care. A thing may be forgotten, but it is never alone as long as I am here. They were lost children, abandoned, fixed on a purpose that no longer had meaning. I took them in, gave them new purpose. I did not create them, 
Yes, they are mine. They are Abidon's. I saw them forged. They were his once, I won't deny it. He created them as assistants to carry out his work on Aeora. But he has long been the overseer of progress in the world. Leaving things behind has always been his way. I allow him to leave his past in my care so that it does not hold him back. You and Abidon have a unique connection, then. I suppose we do. Then the gods have always been able to accomplish far greater things when working together. Nearby we see a shark pass through a school of fish. The fish scatter, evading the predator. I had something I wanted to discuss about the eyeless. You haven't given me the whole truth about them, have you? Careful what you accuse a god of, mortal. The water around us is suddenly icy. We can feel it sap the heat from our veins. Abidon didn't abandon those creatures. He made him forget them. Otherwise, he might remember how he died. And what if I did, mortal? It does him no harm to forget. On the contrary, it lifts a burden. If Abidon remembered, it would threaten the harmony between the gods. It was not so long ago that conflict between us led to disaster in your world, and the death of one of our number. Memory is but an image we create to make sense of the present. It carries no truth or meaning but what we ascribe. A slight alteration to it is a small price to pay for peace. It's wrong to deceive him. I expected better of a god. Memory deceives. It distorts and reimagines. This is no different. The peace between the gods is already fragile. It will not withstand another shock. What's the new purpose did you give them? Some things that are forgotten must never be remembered. Not merely for the benefit of those who forgot, but for the entire world. There can be no second thoughts, no sympathy or stays of execution. The Eyeless were born to fulfill this task, though even their creator did not know it. They are single-minded and relentless. You mean to kill those who remember what you want forgotten. They do not flinch when called upon to do what is necessary. Kith owe them a great debt for the troubles they have hidden away. Ask you about something else. Say on one hand that you had to call down Neoni Brother, yet on the other that you would have stopped it for Abidon. The death of a god is a calamity. You are living in the aftermath of one such death. Surely you can understand. You have said that sympathy can get in the way. What about yours for Abidon? He deserved better. Of all the gods, he was the one who acted, who held to his convictions. The goddess of relentlessness must have appreciated such a quality. I, yes. I admired him for that, but it's more than that. We loved him. The pull and push of the current become long and heavy like a sigh. Whatever he was to me, it was not meant to last. Always our duty is to Aeora first. I knew he opposed what I intended, that he would wish to preserve what I meant to destroy. I knew it would cause a rift that might never be mended, but I never imagined he'd go so far. I never imagined it would mean that I would never know him as I once did. If he doesn't remember not dying, why not begin again with him? Because it might cause him to remember. No, mortal. Better that we should exist as we are now. What happened once must never happen again. Bad enough that I am cursed to remember it. I need you to call off the eyeless. On the contrary, mortal, their work must continue. Far too much was uncovered while they lay dormant. They draw attention to the very things we wish hidden. In my dreams, I have seen them swarming over the deer wood. Those who know too much of the White Forge will be washed clean from Aeora, and then the eyeless shall rest once more. This isn't some lone tribe of dwarves. The Forge sees visitors from all over now. The eyeless will tear the deer wood apart. will never be forgotten. The sea life around us stirs back and forth, agitated and restless. Even if it is as you say, there is nothing that can be done. The eyeless do not think for themselves. They have only the purpose that is given to them. They do not stop until it is fulfilled. They will not change course now for me or anyone. I am sorry. Kauta said they could be called off. Only if those they pursue are no longer a threat. The raid Sarens were stopped before they could take the White Forge. In your case, Watcher, you are well beyond that now. If what you say is true, then the Deerwood is as well. This is your doing, you must intervene. The interventions of God seldom work out to anyone's favor. Our touch is too heavy. The world crumbles beneath it. 
That is why we so often enlist the help of mortals. They execute our wishes with greater care. I have done far too much already. You won't stop them, I will. Your determination is commendable. The eyeless number in the thousands. You will need more than strength or luck. The help of a god would be most welcome. I will give you what aid I can. I bade the eyeless to remain hidden when at rest. They are gathered in the hollow of a great rock splintered from Yoni Brother. It lies in a flooded crater known as Kairon Scar. Know, too, that they were built to answer the call of their master's hammer. When they hear it strike, they come to its aid. If you were to take that piece of his hammer from here and reshape it in Abidon's forge into a likeness of the original, you might be able to call them to you. But destroying them would be another matter. I know of one way, but only from the center of the lion's den. Only with their master's hammer in your service. If you can do all this... If you could reshape what remains of Abidon's hammer and bring it inside their lair, I can instruct you there on what you would need to do. I will do what I can, and I will see you through when the time comes. I will remake this hammer in the White Forge and stop the Eyeless. If you do, if you do not, be assured, they will come for you as they did for the Pargrunen, and an easy turbulence disrupts the calm like an unwelcome thought. Careful as you approach the lake, when I claimed the eyeless, I made sure they would not be discovered while they slept. Many of my most devoted followers stand watch there. They will not allow you near. And there is something far worse, something more fearsome and dangerous than any eyeless. Let us hope you do not attract its attention. And there's nothing you can do? In place of an answer, a sudden surge in the current from beneath sends us hurtling upward. The surface above us approaches fast, shifting and glimmering like quicksilver. We emerge soaking wet on the stone floor of the reliquary, gasping for breath as if we've been holding it for hours. Is that everybody at level 16 then? Oh. Athletics. Uh, Rhymer Summon. Athletics and Rhymer Summon. <laughs> or what's she using? She's using a flat. Using a, a, a mace now? Is that a mace? Morning Star? Is that Morning Star a mace? I think a Morning Star is a mace. Damn it, Maneha. Is a Morning Star Mace? Maneha, where are you? She's also not using that. She's using this cool ass. Or is she? No, why does she ever have that equipped? The Grey Sleeper is what she's using. A fucking Estuk. Of course. What's she doing with that in her hand? Estuk. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Hand it over. Oh, we should have given him. Slaying of beasts. Oh well. Well, there's Abidon's skull. The cracks in his jawbone suggest that a forceful blow separated it from the skull. Judging from the distance of the nearby skull, a tremendous force severed this vertebrae from the rest of the giant body. Stroke a bit the heed. Looks like this is the way back. Oh, nice. They're shouting intruder, but they're not actually attacking me. Intruder. <laughs> okay. Some of them are hostile. Can we talk to the dude again, or is he long gone? Looks like he is taken off. Well, see ya, Andrites. Let's head over to the foundry. Right? Yeah. The fragment of Abidon's hammer grows warm in our hands as if in recognition. It is only a fraction of the size of the original, but there is metal enough to create a hammer fit for a person of our size to wield. In this forge, the fragment could be shaped anew. Recreate the hammer. We call to mind every memory we've witnessed of the great hammer. The image coalesce and take shape in our mind's eye. 
You know, every curve, every engraving, even as a shapeless lump of metal, we can be see the fragment for what is meant to become. The fragment is slow to heat, given the white forge, and quick to cool as we work it against the anvil. Sweat drizzles down our body and puddles at our feet. Our arm grows sore with each swing of the forge hammer until we can barely lift it. Then it's turned to ours. As Davidon's hammer begins to take shape, the ring of our own hammer against it takes on a familiar tone, one that we've heard in our dreams. With each strike, an image flashes in our mind. It is hazy at first, but it gains detail as the hammer begins to resemble the original. Over time, the image becomes a frozen landscape centered around a crater. Eyeless patrol its frozen surface in droves, and this can only be the place Andre described, Karen's scar. The eyeless pause here and there when we strike up and look, at, look up as though hearing an echo on the wind. In the distance, we see more details appear. As more details appear, we can see other landmarks, Dalward, Durgan's battery, and we understand where the lake lies in White March. But we must take this hammer. Finally, with the careful etching of the last detail with our chisel, the hammer is complete. No sooner do we make the final mark than we feel a pure, radiant energy pulsing from within it like a mechanical heartbeat. There is an indescribable beauty to the shape and the waiting in the design. We feel as if this realization of the metal's purpose. We take up the hammer and its power rushes over us in waves and it shakes our bodies so hard we nearly drop to our knees. The tremor passes. The surge of power remains. The hair on our arms stands on end. In our hands is a faithful recreation of a divine instrument. Nice. Watch where you swing that thing. Careful with the weapons of the gods, Watcher. They seldom come without strings. That's a good-looking hammer. Bash somebody's skull at that, I hope they appreciate it. Still has stones added. No other comment? That it? Ooh, somebody's stumbling in. To scold us, no doubt. Ooh, the ogres. I've heard enough. The sound of an argument reaches us from the stairs. Darian marches into the room, arms crossed, while Wengrip bounds along behind him. This threatens all of us now. Matron Berrigan lumbers after Darian and Wengra, flanked by two stout ogres. She's right. We've got to fight together. We also recognize Adderick following them. His shoulders are rigid and his arms are clasped in front of him. Wengra sees us and points enthusiastically. See, Darian? Straight will tell you. We can stop him. Tension crackles in the air. Darian whirls and cuts Wengra off with a chopping motion. If Stray's seen them, he knows better. What's going on here? Something killed a whole crew of hunters out in the wood, tore them apart like dolls. Insects. Despite his steady posture, his eyes flit and flicker like flies, and his upper lip shines with sweat. Something like the creatures that attacked my fort, perchance? Berrigan mutters something to her escort, and they snort in agitation. I told you, all we gotta do is get him in range of these cannons, and then we blast him. She brings her hands together with a loud clap. We don't even know what they are. He shuts his eyes and breathes loudly through his nose. I do. They're known as the Eyeless, the destruction my dreams warned me of. Berrigan's gaze is distant with horror. Suddenly she rounds on Wengra and Darien, and your greed and recklessness have brought them on us all. She rolls her shoulders back and bares her teeth the two villagers, rage hangs around her like a musk. Darien and Wengra each take a step back and square off against the ogres. You burning our village didn't help matters none. Wengra's feral grimace exposes needle-sharp teeth. Her nostrils flare. It wasn't my clan that attacked you. No difference. One ogre stinks as bad as the next. You may be right, Berrigan, but this isn't helping. Perhaps you should go. Um, your interests have never aligned with stalwarts, Berrigan. I doubt that's changed. Calm down, everyone. None of that matters now. Darian and Wegra grumble, shifting on their feet and glaring sullenly. After a pause, Berrigan looks back at us. She folds her hands. I came to offer my clan's help. The others gawk. The White March has been our home for centuries. We'll defend it alongside you. The ogres flanking her grunt their ascent. Your aid will be welcome. She presents an ancient banded horn in both of her calloused hands, holding it out. Sound it anywhere in the White March, and three of my best warriors will be at your side. Your battles become ours. Darian coughs into a fist. What's your plan for dealing with them exactly? 
The Eyeless are hidden at K Run's scar. I'll face them there. Langer and Darien gape at each other in disbelief. That lake's notorious. Folk never come back from then. She breaks off, her eyes suddenly wide. Oh. You'll need all the help you can get. I have fewer men to offer than I would like, but the Iron Flail stands ready. Our siege weapons are at your disposal. Same ones you threw at the battery's walls? Derek doesn't look at him. These eyeless will come for us all if they aren't stopped here and now. His face flushes. Forget it. You're not bringing your army into our backyard. He looks at us and nods. Tell him. Uh... But Derek's right. We need to work together. It's no time to worry about what's past, Darian. I guess you're right. Won't be anything left of Stalwart if we don't stop these monsters anyway. He looks down at the spot his heels ground into the grid. We'll assemble at K Run's scar and await your orders. Be ready, my friend. It will be a great battle. An awkward silence follows. Wengra clears her throat noisily. You know, those heavy cannons you fixed might come in handy. She grins a mistress, twinkle in her eye. Darian starts to groan as she holds up both hands. Hear me out. Karen's scar should be just in range for those guns. You just point out your target and I'll do the rest. Those things are on the move. We don't have much time. If you're really going to stop them, take this. It's the best of the ore we've pulled from Stalwart's mines. He gives a solemn nod. It's not much, but it's good enough to make the old Parker and Smiths proud. I'm sorry about what I said before. Just don't take it out on the rest of the village. He looks away. Call upon the eighth, the ogres. Use the burning pitch trebuchet. Call upon the cannons. Heavy cannon blast. Is the horn an item? Abby Don's hammer. It's a soulbound weapon. A two-handed soulbound weapon. Looks like you can bind to anyone. You can bind it to a dare. Just for fun. Plus four might, and it's legendary. Despite being toppled by a mere fragment of Abaddon's original hammer, this weapon, now sized for kith hands, is still an instrument of awesome destructive force. The face on the great hammer's head still bears the tool marks of their creator. Not even the fires of the White Forge could erase Abaddon's work. Find it. Whoa. Grants destroy Eyeless on crit. Grants Ring of the Ancient Forge once per encounter. Stuns everybody for 10 seconds. Grants Abidon's Labor once per encounter. A crush. Grants a fatigue to the user. I'm not sure what that is. Um, use this hammer to destroy an army of Eyeless at Kron's Scar to maximize it. Enchant. You give it White Forge bonuses as well. Never seen anything like it. Seems to me that we probably, yeah, we got enough to make one more, only one, only one? Is there more here? No. But I need two to make Abidon's hammer especially magical. Damn it. I'm sure there's more out there, but we're not going to go wandering around looking for it. Adair, you're going to be our hammer boy. How's that feel? Uh, we didn't find the... Uh, thigh clef. Where's the horn? Is it an item? Or is it also an ability? It didn't say it was an ability that we'd gained. It doesn't really matter. My dear, why aren't you wearing the silly helmet? Wear the silly helmet. You're wearing a nothing helmet right now, so... Wear the silly one instead. Um, oh, there it is. The horn. Don't give it to him, he's busy. Adair? Wait, where'd it go? There it is. Um, sure. Just want to give it to somebody who we're going to make sure we keep. Now, there is a conversation at the end of this. Should we go directly to Karen's scar? I don't think we've got any other business to take care of. Let's move. There's a conversation at the end of this uh, DLC that is very hard to win depending on the choices that you've made. 
And I have, in theory, modified it so that we should be able to basically do whatever and still win the conversation, which gets you a kind of special ending. Before the scar, uh, which you can't even choose in the... I believe it's not even one that you can choose when you're preparing. Oof. <laughs> Quite the... We might just control Y our way through these once we've proven we can beat the Eyeless back. I'm starting to think you don't pay Galvino near enough for me. Once more I am called upon to set right the gods' transgressions. It has become a tiring refrain. Once more I am called upon to set right the gods' transgressions. It has become a tiring refrain. All this is because of us. Come on, let's finish it. Is it all because of us? Of course. Is that fair? So much shoutier when we got voices turned on. Let's turn it down at least. Lagufeth. Whoever this was, he's been long dead. What remains of the flesh is blackened and frozen solid. This crater worries us and our three companions. It feels wrong, tainted. But the lure of riches is stronger. That giant rock in the center of the lake might contain gold, gems, and more. It took a week of backbreak and labor, but the boat is finished. It may not be entirely watertight, but it'll be enough for us to get across the lake and back. We set off from the shore, an icy wind filling the sail. Sadon grins at us. He'd expressed the most doubt that the boat would float. A moment later, he's gone, barely managing a scream as a gigantic tentacle yanks him from the boat and under the water. More tentacles emerge from the water. The air is filled with the sound of cracking and splintering wood as the boat gets pulled apart. We dive into the water without a second thought and begin swimming madly for shore, hoping our friends are doing the same. Our heavy furs weigh us down, but by some miracle we make it to the land. We hear a burbling sound and look up to see one of the fish people and a lagafeth standing over us, its spear raised. We rise to our knees, our hands raised, showing we have no weapons that we pose no threat. The lagafeth makes a sound again. Wait, we start to say. The creature drives its spear deep into our chest before we can say anything else. Mercifully, the agony is brief before the world fades. Hey. Leviathan. Kraken eyes. Iron circle. Burden. Minus 5% attack speed. And increased armor at very low health. Eh, good way to just get owned. I'm not going to decrease our attack speed just for some extra constitution. Goodbye. A worthy challenge. Yeah, two clubs. I'll see what's on right fanatic. Done for twenty seconds. What was that effect? Oh, that must have been a chanter effect, a friendly one. Shields broke both, yeah. It had that kind of a chanter name, but I was like, we don't have a chanter. Who could this be? It's another Andrite! Don't think it's gonna matter for long. We are a level 16 party, we're very scary. Good thing I sold most of my. We literally have the weapons of the fucking gods. Like, uh... Oh. Got some livers. Just taking taking the time to pull some livers out. Here at the end of the world. It's an eyeless. Can they be knocked down? Yes, they can. Eyeless Stone Piercer. The Eyeless are ancient, mysterious Meg folk, more widely known in myth and fact, with their grotesque build and their crude yet functional limbs. 
They vaguely resemble constructs, but their origins and true purpose are unknown. They know neither hunger nor fatigue, making them singularly relentless foes. Popularly, the Eyeless are said to serve Andra by seeing old or dangerous things forgotten. The peoples of the White March describe them as boogeymen that stalk old roads in secluded places. Parents warn their children not to forget their chores, lest the Eyeless see them forgotten. And people who lose something traditionally thank Andra that the Eyeless did not come for them to... What do you find in an eyeless body? Vessel flesh and binding copper. Eyeless hammer. How often can we use these? One per rest. Two per rest. About the big cannon. So that's how it's gonna go? Could have been more dramatic than that. Obsidian does like to give you an orbital strike, don't they? Ahead. Mm -hmm. Dead end over there. Eyeless hammers. Put them on their knees. Yeah, Adair destroyed the eyeless hammer. Of these awaits. You must learn their weaknesses. All right, then. The hammer. The man with the goofy hat. Tentacle! Uh-oh. Hmm, hmm, be in trouble here. Knock everyone I dislike down. Can tentacles be knocked down? Yes, they can. Blessings. Uh, you got a second wind to pop there? Get on that eyelid. Knock down the tentacles, please. Not for very long. And that's how it goes. I want to throw a heal. Heal, really. Tentacles are too tough. They do not need to be that sturdy. I guess we could just blow them up, can't we? And control Y them. Make them wish they never tented it. Never I cannot rest with enemies inside. Take a quick nap. Quick safe, please. Deep into the sea. I could have done without the tentacle. <sighs> Another of Andra's mindless servants. I'll see her paid for this. I don't think we've seen the last of Andra's secrets. No, not yet. Oh, I don't like that they are not in range. Please go position yourself. Like this, thank you. And you. 
Yes, just like that. Good girl. It dare destroyed an island again. Oh, he's burning up himself. Spooky creatures they are, truly. Big haunted things. Get to the crystal at the bottom of Yoni, brother. We're inside a fucking moon. Little baby moon. Uh-oh. Oh, no. They look friendly. Columns of water rise up from the pools in front of us, shifting and writhing, whipping air around them in a vortex. This can only be Andra's hair, appearing before us at a fraction of the typical size reported by mariners unfortunate enough to encounter them on the high seas. Done well to have come so far. I confess I was not certain you would make it. I do not wish to give false hope. The greater challenge remains in front of you. The eyeless have to be stomped for the good Running of the deer wood. Running the core of this rock is a large growth of crystal. You'll know when you see a it. A blow to the crystal would reverberate through the walls of this place. Strike it enough and the entire structure would crumble. The eyeless would of be buried. Course it would take a person years to cause enough damage. But not with the help of the eyeless. Then you know what must be done. Strike the crystal with Obidon's hammer. The eyeless will wake and come to its call. Join in striking the crystal. They will cluster together and bury themselves. I have realized it is best that they should be ended. For within each of them is a small piece of Ovidum himself. Upon their deaths, those fragments and the memories they contain will be safely dispersed. I had not considered the dangers of allowing them to persist until a watcher appeared at my abbey. Yeah, you says the gods are rigid idiots. The ideals remain. Only my methods have changed. A single strike upon the crystal will not be enough. The eyeless respond only as long as the hammer rings. You will need to remain until their work is complete, wielding the hammer until the walls come crumbling down. Uh, all things must come to an end. It is a difficult thing to accept that one's dying day has already been marked. It is good that you have no illusions about your own. The eyeless cannot be reasoned with or fled from. One day not far from now, they would kill you and level the Deerwood. You have seen what they will do. This is the way you can and stop the them. And truth is that you are marked by the eyeless for a reason. It would be better for all if the things you have seen were forgotten. Ain't that convenient? Crushing's a bad way to go. Maybe we should just hang ourselves. <laughs> World? Maybe that's not such a bad thing. The watery columns drop all at once back into the pool, setting up a small splash. The pool settles, and looking down into it, we only see the faces of us and our companions, alone and condemned. Oh, hello. There, there, there destroyed the eyeless. It's very cool when he does that. Critting a lot. Getting lots of crits. Um, let's turn voices back off. Because I don't really like them. I only like the, the random comments. I don't like the voiceover. Devil of Garak, you are my turret. Well, okay, she didn't need to be this time. Hey! You're 150 raw 
all damage to enemies to unlock the next level. Uh, merciless gaze on kill. Oh, cool. Chant. You white forge this one? No. Oh, she doesn't have enough room on it. It's actually already over enchanted. <laughs> Such is the way of, uh, I guess if we had enchanted it earlier, it might have been able to keep its enchants as it continued to stack more and more on top of itself. But we didn't know. We did not know. Uh, judging by the claw marks and scales around the edge of the pool, we believe it's regularly used by Lagafeth. Something shimmering in the depths of this frigid murky water. It's us. What did we get? We gained Frither's Plated Greaves. Attempt to hide. Stealth 10. Logifest and follow. Brilliant. Heavy. Damage proofed. Minor. Plus 3 damage reduction. Plus 5% armor speed penalty. And grants wild sprint. I don't think so. I don't think that's a thing. Get up. Come on. There's no time for games. I don't think we're gonna finish this shit tonight. We got more to do after White March. A ridge overlooks a broad chamber half flooded with lake water. We could crawl down this way, but it looks too steep and slick to climb back up. Well, oh, time to go. Whoa, hello. I courted a girl for a while, looked like that. Tentacles and all. Uh, I would have a word with the salty wench when this is over. Um, let's first grant... That. Oh, he's already badly injured. <laughs> Um, well that was easy. That didn't take much. Stun them each for a minute or so. Get up, devil. Can we loot from the kraken? Can we take its eyes? Its pieces? Um, where do we get kraken eyes from then, if not from the kraken? Should we have killed its tentacles? Would its individual pieces have dropped eyes? Could have, I suppose. Not that it matters, but... Alright, let's rest, and here's the crystal. Load up a long conversation. An enormous crystal juts from the wall like a spearhead protruding from a wound. An army of reflections stares back at us from the crystal's perfect facets. It echoes the sound of our footsteps and soft ringing hums. Somebody will have to take up Abidon's hammer and strike the crystal, and Andra warned that whoever does so will be buried with his place with the eyeless. Whom do we choose? Ourselves. The gods really have it in for you. Wish they knew you like I did. Just hope you're not doing this for those louts in Stalwart. Even the new ones ain't worth it. A great act of freedom. Your body will suffer for it, but your soul will flourish. Always I will remember your example. Straight into the fire, then. Your chances aren't favorable, but at least you've learned to embrace the test. I told you I'd be good for you, Wanter. Your brave soul stray. Should met you sooner. We have the hammer and swing it at the crystal. A perfect clear tone rings through the air and resonates through our teeth. Seconds later, ripples shiver through the water. Something big is coming. We give the others a final nod. The rest of the party scrambles out of the flooded cavern and flees through the tunnels. We continue hammering at the crystal, each strike magnifying the last. The echoes build into physical tremors. Meanwhile, a heavier rhythm pulses through the cave. Footsteps. Dozens of them. The others round a corner only to see a line of eyeless advancing. The creatures stagger to the rhythm of their hammer thuds below. 
if they craned their necks toward the party ratcheting back their piston arms. Cast ring leader, consider who will cast it. The party belatedly realizes you are the only person capable of this. Repulsing seal, consider who will cast it. The party belatedly realizes you are the only one who could do this. Dodge past the eyeless, the portal barrels through the monsters. One of them grazes Devil of Carrick with a mace-like fist in passing. Fortunately, the creatures are too focused on hammering to give chase. They maintain a steady tempo in the crystal. Eyeless gather in the cavern where they batter the walls in time to the hammer's rhythmic blows. The ground shakes, falling rocks and shattering crystals splash to the ground. The party flees through the dark, rumbling corridors. More spellbound eyeless shamble along, but they're too entranced by the swelling cadence to take more than an idle swipe at the party. The tunnel narrows. Light filters throw ahead. The exit must be around the next bend. But it's clogged with rubble. Meanwhile, the ground drops several feet at once, and the tunnel begins rolling on its axis. The distant sound of rushing water echoes from the cavern. Use a pry bar! There must be a weak spot, but we'll take a practiced eye to find it. Who's most... I don't know. Adair? Can't find a leverage point. There must be a weak spot. Zawa! Devil! Mechanic 7! Ha ha! Eyeless continue pouring out, our ears ring at the ever-growing cacophony of smashing rock and shattering crystal. Meanwhile, the water level is rising up. Boom, boom. A skull-splitting crack rends the air as a surge of water knocks us from our feet. The entire cavern rotates, plunging us into a freezing soup of jagged metal, torn flesh, and stone. The others dash across the lake, the ice squeals and crackles rocking dangerously underfoot. The sinking moon groans. Long fissures race across the ice. Out for a more stable place to cross. The surface of the ice is riddled with cracks. Only someone who knows what to look for can find safe passage. Who will go? Maneha. All seems well until the party's halfway over the shore. Everyone dumps in the freezing lake. Everyone makes it in the middle of the lake, only the tip of the moon. The survivors watch in silence as it sinks. The world seems to be falling apart in slow motion. We sing into the lake alongside the dark shapes of the moon fragments of the crushed eyeless. Our limbs ache and our lungs burn. Sparks flicker across our vision. Not sparks. Scales. Lagafeth gather in front of us as we notice something unusual in their iridescent eyes. A spark of uncommon intelligence. We hear a whisper in our mind. You freed us from our prison in Durgan's battery. Consider our debt repaid. Lagafeth, possessed by the spirits of Marun and some of the other Pargunans, swarm and rush us to the surface. At last we reach the shallows. We punch through a thin crust of ice and crawl ashore, trembling but alive. We made it! We killed a moon! We stand at the edge of the lake. The bobbing of the ice and the rippling of the water's surface slows until we're looking at a moment frozen in time. When the world begins to move once more, it moves in reverse. The surface of the water churns and roils like it's about to spew something up, and it does. The fragment of Yoni Brother rises, unbroken. Ice reforms across the surface of the lake, spreading in long, freezing fingers. Eyeless file out from the moon fragment and onto the ice. They wind around the moon in an ever-widening spiral. They stop as they head to the line approaches us. They speak in a single voice that resonates with grinding metal and hissing steam. We shatter and sink, discarded like worn tools. Why have you consigned us to oblivion stray? You would have destroyed Cat Nua, Durgan's battery, and more. You would have killed many innocent people. We do not cherish violence, but we will fight to defend the legacies of this world. The eyeless stand tall, ratcheting their arms back. In one hand a hammer, and the other a mace. We protect the greatest works of civilization, lest it collapse beneath its own weight. And why did you storm Durgan's battery two hundred years ago? Their protest is as sharp as squealing metal. We would sooner sacrifice our own bodies than dislodge a single stone from such a place. Why do you torment us with baseless accusations? You were changed from a preserver to a destroyer. Andra changed you from a preserver to a destroyer. The eyeless are still, but we hear their gears whir as their collective spirit ponders this. And we were betrayed. No, you were adapted to serve a new purpose. 
The creature nearest us smashes its clubbed ice fist into the ice, roaring in protest. And what if we adapted your flimsy hands with iron claws, your brittle bones with mighty steel? Another eyeless branches a sickle as tall as us. A part of ourselves was cut away, stray, and we were made to betray something we cherish. We feel their bitter agony like a hammer strike. The legacy of the Ingwithins, you mean. The bedrock of civilization. Suddenly they attack the ice beneath them, slicing and shattering it with mighty swings from their iron arms. And where the ice breaks, ancient towers rise, blotting out the blue sky and white peaks. What is this? Each culture builds on the bones of the last, yet many look only up at where they would go, never down at the foundations that bear them. Like a mason who builds a listing tower, the remaining ice sheet cracks and groans. What perils do they inflict on their progeny, and what dishonor on their forebears? Hear the strain of crumbling stone in the voice of the eyeless. The betrayal of memory upsets you greatly. It is accepting a gift only to spit in the face of the giver. Every advance in the crafts and institutions of Kith was forged by skill and sacrifice. We feel these words and the anger behind them in our bones. The people cut off from their history will wither, and they deserve no less. And, uh, no, they'll be... Then what do you suggest? To pull the blinders from the eyes of gods and kith. That is why we must return to ourself and restore Abidon. Perhaps Abidon was meant to forget his past. Some knowledge is too dangerous for this world. Hmm. What do you mean by returning to yourself? When Yoni Brother fell, Abidon lost much, his will to preserve the memory of how and why he died. But he built us with fragments of his own soul. In returning, we can restore to him what was taken. Perhaps Abidon was meant to forget his past. Some knowledge is too dangerous for this world. Something grinds and rumbles from the chest of the eyeless. It's laughter. A facile argument. One that defends stasis, not progress. Andra said Abidon's memory would threaten the peace between the gods. Um. Just as fire clears dead wood from the forest, struggle makes way for new developments. Flame rolls across the ice. As it dies away, clumps of ice melt. The towers rise higher. Kith shouldn't have anything as powerful as the White Forge. I don't know if I agree with that, yet you can kindle its fires. That nearly ended with the destruction of Durgan's battery and the deaths of thousands. A fluke, but a costly one. The souls retreat into their own thoughts. Still, you point to an exception. Anamanthi has made no progress, yet it's responsible for Vich, the Baelric incident, and the swiddle of desperate families. And yet you persuaded the Duke to allow Anamanthi to continue unfettered. Do not condemn knowledge when it becomes inconvenient for you. You speak of history as if it were a guide, yet it doesn't always provide a good example. You do not look to it for one. History is not a moral force, but a set of facts. These facts show Kith where they have come from and how to move forward. The Pargrunin were obsessed with the past. They died in the keep they'd built to honor it. And their brethren have built a culture that stretches across Aeora, all because they recognize the importance of a shared legacy. Yet the Pargrunin of Durgan's battery might have built more if they'd surrendered this obsession with legacy and moved east. And before you killed them, they nearly destroyed themselves arguing over the meaning of that legacy. It had drove them to create marvels. Could it have torn them apart with equal force? We feel the eyeless wrestling with this question, shifting and struggling under its weight. Maybe so. But we would not cast history aside over one such example. The Dear Woodens and Glenfathens have fought two wars over their history, and they still haven't moved forward. But the memory of those wars has likely saved them from another now, when it would shatter a barren Deerwood. That's not saying much. Better if the two nations could form a stronger accord. And how are such ties forged but through years of peace? You speak of a worthy goal, but only a steadily built history can achieve it. Stalwart and the Iron Flail remained at odds even in the face of a bigger threat, all because of their history. The problem is not that the two remember too much of their history, but rather too little. The ice underfoot becomes suddenly clear. Between our boots we see an ocean separating a deer in the eastern reach. 
Bade Sarens and Deer Woodens alike began as pioneers from a deer. They all came seeking opportunity. Boats as small as ants crawl across the glassy blue. Were they to look farther back, they would see their common origins and desires. The ice dulls and thickens once more. So the experience of history is subjective. Evil remembers what feels immediate and personal, just as you remember your own betrayal. The painful truth. They pause, recalling their suffering. We feel it radiate from them like heat. We admit that history can become a hindrance. Perhaps history does not always serve progress, but what then? The collective essence churns and percolates in question. Let's see. Memory remains a burden, even when the events and people it recalls are long gone. It's pain with no purpose. Burdens strengthen the bearer, and they warn against repeated mistakes. Why would you discard them so hastily? I'm awakened. I'm tormented by questions from a past life. A rare opportunity, but you have the opportunity chance to answer them, to do things left undone. The creatures raise their misshapen arms, and the voice of their souls is as deep and melodious as a bell. But those things don't matter now. I was able to leave them behind. They obviously weren't important. I feel something peeking and prying into our essence. If that were true, they would not trouble you now. Maneha shouldn't have to suffer guilt over an act she committed in a past life. Pleasing or no, that memory was a part of her. In surrendering it, she lost a part of herself. The part that spent every waking hour obsessed with old history, perhaps. What I lost was a burden, and one that bent me over for years. It would be better if Kith did not become trapped by guilt, sorrow, and shame. But we speak of what should be, recognize what is. Yet such destructive memories are rare. Surely others are strengthened by retrospection, and amidst pain. Zawa witnessed the fall of his own people, he spent his life weighed down by that trauma. All civilizations run their course and fall, just as the people in them grow old and die, and yet to endure in memory is a kind of immortality. But Zawa condemned the Takan to a second death merely to escape the pain of their loss. This pain is a gift to my soul. I am glad to remember them. You see... Such pain has value. I've said my piece. Memory remains a burden. I've said my piece. Meant to forget. I've said my piece. Then let Abidon... Then return to Abidon with perspective as well as memory. Let history be a tool for progress, not an end unto itself. We shall temper our memory with context. We shall see that the foundation of history is not only broad but also firm. A great wind shoves at our back. Our ears pop and we feel for a moment as if all the air is being sucked from the sky. Suddenly it ends, and we are standing on the snow looking over Carrion's scar. Kron's scar. The eyeless disappeared beneath the lake, their bond to Andra finally severed. With his threat ended, hope returned to the White March. Hunters returned to the wilderness and travelers to the roads. Tales of the Watcher's bravery replaced stories of monsters in the woods. The villagers of Stalwart busied their hands with work, their tongues with song, eager to seize on the promise of peace. Ding. Abby Don's Hammer. Mythic. Oh, yeah. Not even the fires of the White Forge could erase Abby Don's work. Did it actually get better? Was it already, was it legendary before and now it's mythic? Yeah, I think it was legendary before and now it's mythic. Well, that's pretty cool. The Forgotten Army. We did it. We defeated the White March. What do we do now? Uh, well, first of all, we never did finish Zawa's quest. What do we have to do to do, do Zawa's quest? What does he need done? True to form. No, that's Aravius, whom we've almost forgotten. The Fisherman's Penance, uh, Search Fishery at Night, no, I don't care about that. Songs of the Wild, Sacred Instruments. Oh, we never returned that to her. Sealed Missive, Find and Capture Through Your Songbirds. No, oh, well, I've, I've got to do something with you. Surely, surely, right? 
Huh. This person seems to think that there is actually unchecked dialogue. More of you and your beliefs? Ask about something else? Have you learned to fight? No? Tell me about your home? Uh... What is it your master never taught you? That's one of the ones that comes unlocked. Oh, interesting. I don't remember this one. What is it your master never taught you? When I was brought to him, I knew how unworthy I was. But if he disapproved, he never showed it. In my shame, I gave him everything I had. He tutored me for seven years, and in that time I became greater than the rest. Then the day came when he was to teach me the final secret of the Anitle. This is the unbeatable warrior all the Khan chieftains must become to protect our people. Ixapilla never showed. I found him in his study, meditating, or perhaps staring off, I couldn't say. Master, I said, is it time for me to learn to be the Anitle? Not yet, he said. That was all. He never gave me another lesson. A year later, he was dead of old age. They named me Chieftain anyway. Maybe he was testing you. I thought so as well. I tried everything. Patience, rage, cleverness, acceptance. Not yet, he would say. Not yet. Someone else must have been able to teach you. At any time, two people know the secret of becoming the Anitle, the Chieftain and the Master of the Nalpazka. When Ixapilo died, the knowledge was lost to us forever. You seem to have managed in spite of that. Have I? What happened after you became chieftain? Word of Ixapilo's death spread. Our enemies saw the opportunity. The Kachmadal chieftain came with gifts to honor my rule, but his real purpose was to look me in the eye. No of Zawa might be beaten. I looked at him, and I imagined that I was the Anitle, fray of all worldly snares, that my master had taught me everything. When he turned to leave, I saw he wore a secret smile, and I knew I had failed. Three days later, they attacked. They were many times greater than our numbers. They had been trying to conquer us for generations, and the Takan chieftains had always sent them running. The power of the Anit lay. He shakes his head. In my heart, I knew we would lose, and it would be because I was not the Anit lay. What did you do? What we had always done. I gathered my Nalpaska warriors and led a charge into the belly of their army. And Nalpaska believed Zawa was the Anit lay, and I gave them strength. For their sakes, for Takan, I believed it too. My mind found a place it had never reached before. I could see my enemies' moves before they made them. I could see my own actions in front of me, the path to victory. I did as I saw, and the Kechmadal fell in heaps. And then the Kechmadal chieftain came to face me, and he knew Zawa was not the Anitle. When I saw him, I knew it too. I hesitated. My enemies fell upon me. One by one, the Nalpaska were defeated, and the Khan was conquered. What became of your people? He takes a slow breath. Of the men they made slaves, of the women wives. Their way is to absorb the conquered, make them forget themselves. If Kechmadal defeated you, how did you survive? They take you alive if you are a chieftain. They break your body and your spirit. Then they show you to their people and your and to yours broken. To their people and to yours broken. After that they cut off your head so that you may drink your soul from it. They may drink your soul from it, but you got out of it. He laughs. Oh no, they did all those things to me. They flayed me until my screams became whispered, until I no longer knew who I was, and my only hope was to die soon. But they didn't stop, and that was their mistake. In my lowest moment, I released my grip on many worldly things I had come to embrace since my master's death. The pain made the world clear again. They brought me out of it to be executed, not knowing any better. They swung the machete down upon my neck, but it would not cleave. Each hack of the knife brought great pain, and the pain showed me glimpses of pure truth. For a moment in time, I was the Anatle. I broke the bonds by seeing beyond them. I slew my executioner by knowing I would slay him. You were able to free your people after that. All at once, Zawa seems to deflate. No. When the pain faded, so did my enlightenment. But it was enough to make my escape. I swore to return when my soul was ready to defeat the catch model when I had rediscovered my master's lost secrets. You said you swore to return to liberate your people. Did you ever free them? No. I searched my empty homeland for any trace of Ixapilo's knowledge, but I knew that he had left none. It would have been too dangerous. When that failed, I began searching the land to see if knowledge of the Anatle had come from abroad. I 
visited temples and monasteries. All the while, Zal was trying to find an answer within himself as well. Meditation, Malkachoa, a thousand practices he had learned as Nalpaska or dreamed on his own. He becomes nearer to the Anitle every day, but his soul is not free. He is not Anitle. Why not try to free them anyway if you're closer? Is there any way I can help? Perhaps there is. In my journey to Stalwart, I passed through a place that put my soul on edge. I don't know what it was about this place, but I had intended to return there after I fulfilled my pledge to Stalwart's mayor. The answers I search for now are of the soul, and such resonances should not be ignored. I believe the locals call the place Whitestone Hollow. It lies east of Stalwart. I would return there and explore its energy if we should pass that way. Why not free them anyway if you're close? The final step is the difference between invincibility and certain failure. Kitch model has only grown over time, swallowed all its rivals. It would take no less than the Anit Lay to free and protect the Takan now. But if you die without rediscovering your master's knowledge, then the Takan will be no worse off than they are now. But they do deserve better. Let's keep moving. Ting, ting, ting. Glad that we looked into that. That was confusing, Mr. Interface. We should go back to Stalwart briefly, right? Talk to people? At least to this new mayor. Royce. What's your deal? This woman looks up like she's heard bad news. She shakes her head and holds up her hands before we can even begin. Look, you can tell Hammond I ain't seen Mila all day. And besides, you ought to keep a better eye on his shop if you don't want little ones poking around. What's this about? She blinks and is suddenly embarrassed. Oh, you're the one who opened the battery, aren't you? It's really nothing someone like you needs to be concerned with. Actually, it's my girl, Mila. She's been getting herself all sorts of trouble poking around that Hammond's Emporium. But you ain't here about her, huh? You don't know where your child is. What's Hammond's Emporium? New shop. Built of where Katie's home used to be, near the Western Palisade. Hammond's one of them that came up from Deerford. Sells good steel, but just about holds his nose every time he crosses path with one of us. You don't know where your own child is? She backs away like she's been slapped. I didn't say that. It's hard to keep track of her with all the commotion around here lately. Do you have any idea where she might be? She's been out for quite a while now. That's nothing new. She chews her lip, wondering. Still, I can't help but worry that she's gone and gotten herself into some trouble. If you were to keep an eye or two open for her while you're in town, I'd greatly appreciate it. I'll make sure she's not in any trouble. Oh, thank you. Everyone's so busy these days with the mines and the forge opening back up again. It's kind of you to help. Is there somewhere she likes to go? She likes Hammond's Emporium. Let her father know where she's gone? Please don't worry him. He's got enough trouble at his job already. Truly, all of us appreciate what you did, opening the battery back up. Folks like my Ludgar are making good money, patching up all the damage out front. Please don't set his mind spinning about the where Mela is. I won't say anything, don't worry. Just stay away from him. Word is you can't keep a secret if your life depended on it. <laughs> Not wrong. Wild Mila. Um. I'm a little bit busy. Hello, Hammond. What do you have for sale? Does he sell any of these ores? They say that she's, he sells good steel. I mean, he's just talking about weapons, I'm sure, but it'd be reasonable for him to sell a couple of ores. It's so disappointing that we can't uh, white forgeify Abaddon's hammo, the colored coat. Wicked briars when endurance is below 51%. No, nothing of any interest. There's a little girl, Mila, that comes around here. I hear she's been causing trouble for you. She's out of control, though I suppose we can hardly blame her over the way her mother's always screaming at her. She leans across the counter and speaks in a conspiratorial whisper. I mean, where do you think the little rascal learns this kind of behavior, huh? He tilts his head. Only person I've ever seen give her a proper talking to is that wild woman who loaders around the hut just south of here. Aska, that's her name. I don't know what it was about, but those girls' eyes were this big. But I suppose someone's got to do it. I told the girl's mother I'd be speaking to Mayor Tarfos if I kept her picking around my shop again, so I guess it worked. Mm. Uh, I knew that Malkachoa was bad. Blazes, what am I to do with all these? A well-built dwarven woman stands before us, one hand on her head and the other holding a few sheets of paper. Three complaints of blights in Whitestone Hollow, and who are these people? Vagrants faithful? Great. Another pack of religious zealots. Like they're popping up out of the snow these days. She glances up at us. Oh, sorry, Stray, just a little preoccupied. 
Things have quieted down some with the ogres lately, but there's been no shortage of new trouble or work for those interested. Just saying. Heard you scolded Royce's girl. You are Magrin's faithful. Bandits and horse thieves, as far as I can tell. Led by a woman named Rudwith. Problem is that little group keeps growing and they've started tearing through some of the smaller villages. They were last spotted by Searing Falls and rumor is they're heading in our direction. Stalwart's just getting its bearings. We can't afford this kind of trouble. Bring me Rudwith's head and I'll see you a little richer for it. Blights? The Terror of Whitestone Hollow. It's a grand blight that turned up after the avalanche. Real disaster, that. Great big heap of snow right on top of one of our main trade routes. We can't start fixing the road till we get the blights out of there. Can't exactly ask you to bring back this thing's head. But word is the Terror's last victim was a caravan master. Turns out this fellow always wore a certain brooch. Figure it's somewhere in the monstrosity's belly. Bring me the brooch and I'll take it as proof you handle the blight. Sound fair? Heard you scolded the girl. You know what that girl did? Snatched a whole chicken from the grass rest, raw. I told her I better not catch her thieving again, but I was trying my damnedest not to laugh. Funny kid. She wipes a tear from the corner of her eye. It's gotta be rough on her, you know. Her old man's working again at the battery, and he's one absence away from getting fired. Again. Blazes, the only reason Ludgar still has a job is because he and Wingers are softy beneath all that soot. But Mila, she showed up at the battery the other day and nearly got him sacked. Since then, I've seen her keeping to herself. Spends a lot of time at the temple, come to think of it. We're just chasing a girl around town. Where's the lady who had the tracking thing? She's around here somewhere, right? I thought she was on the dock. Ah, she is. Ista. Didn't find any ore deposits, but I did find this. What? So it works. What a day. But why these gems? I didn't think the device would be able to pick up inert Adra. Fascinating. I have to study this farther. But all the same, it worked. At last, a breakthrough. With the Adra to work from, I can refine the enchantments. We'll be digging up iron, gold, Adra, all of it. Here you go. This is going to change everything. Oh, I won't leave you empty-handed, of course. Here, I had to set aside for supplies, but I don't think I'll be staying in Stalwart much longer. I won't forget all you've done for me. They'll hear about this back home, I promise you. Who knows? Perhaps the next they'll name the next battery after you. Hmm. The, the temple? Masca? Okay, now you're just pissing me off. Straighten out, damn you. Temper Masca. Sorry, Master, it just slipped down. What made you, why'd you decide to go to Disciple of Abaddon? Family tradition, one I've managed to keep going. She glares at the unfinished sword in her anvil, barely. Better get back to it before Master Ingram gets annoyed with me. I'm looking for Mila. Sorry I haven't seen her. Ingram. Our doors are always open. I heard Royce's girl Mila sometimes here. She usually sits just there by the forge and draws with some of the charcoal nubs. Poor girl's lonely. The only other children in town are a few years older, and the others would have been her age as uh, well. We're all hollow-born. So where is she? Uh, she's lonely. Is she going out to her father? Likes to sit by the furnace and draw. Maybe there's something to see. No. Oh, wait. Durgan iron ingots. Damn it. We need those. How do we get them? Minor reputation loss. No problem. Oh, Mila's drawing. A slightly singed piece of paper has charcoal drawing on the front. Uh, girl with two spooky ghosts. I should ask someone who knows Mila well to see if they know more about this place. Who knows her well? But you're always clutching that staff makes me think Magrin burned off the other one. That what happened? We are not all so afraid of the fire. Some of us see the beauty of its work. Um, someone who knows her well. Her father? Her mother? Who knows her well? Yes, it's her father. 
Um, and we want You must gather your party before venturing forth. People get so mad about that shit. But do we actually have enough to make enough to be useful? Nope, still one shy. God damn it. God damn it. Oh, we can't zap right back out from here? Fuck. Maybe there's more steel to be found if we poke around. Old guard's key. Surely there's, yes, one more steel. Haha. <laughs> I just want to have a fancy Abaddon hammer. Doo -doo. White Forge. One more. And that should be exactly how much we need to make this a Durgan refined weapon. Oh, yeah. That's right. Mythic. Do 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 do. Oops, maybe a mace if I'm lucky, but no sword. We've been having some difficulties. If, it, if my work doesn't improve soon, they'll kick me out of the temple. Can't be a priest if you're not a proper smith unless you help me. Go on. Snuck a peek at Master Ingram's lore books and came across a ritual that can enchant a forge hammer to boost smithing skill. It's exactly the kind of edge I need. I've already completed the first part of the ritual, crafting the hammer. Unfortunately, the next two parts require travel to the Deerwood, and there's no way Master Ingram would let me leave for any time soon. Uh, I'll complete the forge hammer ritual for you. That's great. The hammer actually turned out all right. First place I need to go is the Shrine of Abaddon in Crucible Keep. That's in the first fires district in Defiance Bay. Never been there myself. Just place the hammer at the shrine. It should get blaster or something. After that, I need to find the Shrine to Magrin in Magrin's Fork, not far from Defiance Bay, to the north of the city. Do the same thing, and then head back here. Uh, I'd just, uh, better get back to it before Master Ingram gets annoyed with me. We'll do it. Okay, we have to actually go fucking reforge our fucking hammer again. Hello. Does everyone else see that kraken? Ludgar, aren't you Mila's father? Do you know where this is? That's Whitestone Hollow? <laughs> I think those are supposed to be the standing stones. Look at that, my kid's an artist. Thanks for bringing this. I'll tack it up next to my cot. What happened to you? Bad hip that got worse after a night with Kulmar's rot gun. Oh, it's, that's not a new line. So where is that supposed to be? Somewhere in Whitestone Hollow. Okay, well, that's vague. The earth shook, and the lookout saw giant clouds rising from Kron's scar. You went to Star Wars, you saved the world. Whitestone Hollow over here. A wanted criminal by the name of Nairi the Deft has arrived at the stronghold. Um, oh, drakes have been seen attacking the keep. Just ought to resolve that shit. Um, pay off this bastard. And then reconstruct the things that were broken. 
And we need to make sure that uh, everything's over 30 before the end to get the proper ending. The proper ending. So probably when we're wrapping up, we should just uh, hire a bunch of hirelings. <laughs> Here's the Decon. Search for and pursue the Spirit Lion. We gotta find the Spirit Lion, and we gotta... Are these the Standing Stones at Whitestone Lake? Uh-oh. There is a spirit lion there just ahead. Can you see it, Watcher? His wide pupiled eyes track the movement of some unseen animal. The master who's the this lion was the symbol of my master, Rixapilo. This is a sign. Has he come here at last to teach me what he would not in life? To be the Anit Lay? I thought the catch model defeated you, isn't this too late? What do you propose we do? I have some herbs prepared. Malkachoa plus some things I've been saving. You should eat them so we can meet with the lion in its world. It would be an honor if you could come with me on this journey. A watcher may see things I cannot. I don't want to do that. No, very well. He looks at the rest of the party. That goes for everyone. I would welcome the presence of friends. He pours a scattering of leaves and mushrooms into a cupped hand and holds them out for the others to inspect. I'll try anything once. A bunch of times if it's good. There are simpler ways to understand the world, monk. A single stroke of my staff would do, but very well. No better friends than one sharing good drugs. This ain't fair. Are you ready to begin? Yes, let's begin. Sawa distributes his mix of herbs, keeping a generous amount for himself. The plants give off a variety of strong, conflicting odors, some sweet, some acrid, and at least one that induces immediate sneezing. Their appearances are largely unfamiliar to us. We drop a handful of the mixture into our mouth and chew. The taste is dull and earthy at first, but within moments of chewing it becomes powerfully sour, then sweet like nectar, and then it begins to take on a new character that's unlike anything we've ever eaten before. Our vision swims, and we see the world in a different, more vibrant spectrum. Zawa takes one look at our expression and laughs. You are ready. Spirit Lion. Not that the lion escape us. Is that flower singing? No, stay focused, Zawa. A spirit. A lone spirit hovers back and forth, agitated, muttering. I can learn from them, from their mistakes. Their failures have revealed the path to me, and I am very close. The spirit points to a scattered collection of maimed and contorted bodies distributed around a stone pedestal. Something odd registers in our mind about the corpses, and then the realization dawns. They all appear to belong to the same person. Zawa chuckles. I wouldn't be so sure. What are you getting close to? On that pedestal you see before you, the one with the bodies, a shiver of irritation ripples over the spirit. Yes, the one with the bodies, as I was saying. On that pedestal you see before you, I placed the gem for safekeeping. You have never seen such a perfect gem. I regretted leaving it behind almost immediately. It has been my every waking thought ever since. Why do you want it? It is all I have left of something that was important to me. Very important by the look of it. I might be able to get it for you. The spirit seems to consider this. Wisps of essence dart in and out of its shape like bolts of electricity. That would be most welcome. Can't we watch him fetch it once? Maybe pick up some pointers. Retrieve the spirit gem. Oh, trap trick. Cute. Can we see these traps? Or are we simply fated to step upon them? Things were fated. What was that? I feared nothing. Nothing! Sentimental gem. This gem appears at first glance to be strikingly beautiful. Yet upon further examination, there seems to be nothing special about it. Secrets of the Takan. Were you able to retrieve the gem? Yes, here it is. The spirit pulses excitedly with light and warmth. This is a great relief. Give it here. The spirit extends claw-like translucent hands toward us, cupped together. And then we let the gem drop. It passes through the spirit's hands and lands on the ground. Ah, clumsy. No need to worry. I've got it now. The spirit crouches to pick up the gem. It scoops at the gem, but cannot make contact with it. It does so over and over. This is a snare my master never told me of. How great, how subtle the hold of the past upon us. Let's keep moving. Zawa nods. An old shaman hunches over a translucent table. Paint is streaked on either side of her eyes like flames. She casts an assortment of strange objects onto the table. A finger bone, a Stelgard tooth, a turtle shell, a few stones painted with symbols. 
She studies them over and over with disbelieving eyes. At last she looks up. There is no mistake. Portents do not lie. Dawa, you will be our chieftain. You will succeed Exipilo and lead us to victory over the catch model. I will tell Exipilo that he must accept you. The path must be cleared for your reign. Whoa, hello. Knock that spore prone. Level 16 party, very scary. Still breathing heavily, Zawa appears deep in thought. He notices our glance. The shaman's vision always stayed with me. After my master had passed, even after the Takan were conquered, I thought of what that shaman had said and held on to hope. But I wonder if it did if it did not also make me proud and foolhardy, if I ignored my own defeat because I did not feel it possible. The Takan aren't defeated yet. You're still here. You may liberate your people yet. Zawa has done his people no favors as chieftain, and Ketch Model would mock your words. But what you say is true, nevertheless. The lion went this way, didn't it? There it is, I see it. I didn't see it. Where'd it go? This way? You see where it went? No, I did not. Haggard man. The man's face is weather beaten, his eyes are sunken deep into his skull, his body is scarcely more than a string of bones. He speaks with great effort, his voice dry and grainy. You, will you help me? Water, from the waterfall, please. I can carry you over to the waterfall, then you can drink from the source. I have tried, but the water eludes me. I open my mouth, and it falls only on either side. I place cupped hands beneath and pull them out dry. Only the first time was I able to taste it. Never have I tasted anything so pure. Ever since, I have not been able to bring myself to leave. I wish only to taste it once more. That would be enough. Why from the waterfall? Why not the pond? The man shakes his head sadly. It appears to be the same in every way, but alas, it only makes my thirst greater. Only water from the waterfall will do. I wish it were not so. I'll see what can be done. You will need this to collect the water. I will be forever grateful. Where is the waterfall? Over here. It's flowing upward. Examine the water. Other than its direction, it seems ordinary. Gather some water. Uh, it's burning. Use resolve to resist the illusion. This place boasts powerful illusions, and we are sure this is one of them. We cling to this knowledge and the certainty that none of this is happening. For a moment, the illusion holds. We hold the water skin in place despite the agony in our fingers. Skin gives way to flesh and then to bone. But in the face of our surety, the enchantment weakens quickly. The pain fades, and from one moment to the next, the ghastly image of our melting hand is gone. The water skin is quite full, and we are able to draw it away without further incident. When we go to replace the stopper, something strikes our hand from below, and we've been carried upward from the waterfall current. It drops into the pool. We reach down, a handful of jewels, pure and blue as the water itself. Secrets of the Takan. Haggard man. Have you had any success? We were able to capture some water, yes. Wonderful, I've waited so long. His fingers tremble with excitement as he closes his hand around the stopper and slowly twists it. The stopper comes free suddenly and flies from his hands, propelled by a violent burst of steam. Oh no, oh no. He upends the water skin, holding it above his lips, but not a single droplet falls. He shakes it, twists it, squeezes it, all to no avail. The water is gone. Given his history, I am surprised he had not foreseen this possibility. He longs not for water, but for the experience of first tasting it. He's bound for disappointment. His suffering is very pretty, yet it feels empty. 
What value does it have if he refuses to learn from it? Can he not see that he seeks something that can never be recovered? Ixapilo sits meditating. He opens his eyes and looks at Zawa. Hello, pupil. Come to me with a question, do you not? He coughs, dry as desert stand. Zawa stares at him, his mouth quivering faintly. Yes, Ixapilo. I have sought your wisdom across many lands over many years. Are you here to grant it to me? Yes, pupil. I am here for you. Zawa nods, drawing a deep breath. Our people are captives of the catch model. I need to know the secrets of the Anid Lay. Of course. The answer has been with you the whole time, pupil. You are blind not to have. Ixapilo breaks down into a coughing fit. As he coughs harder, granules of dust fly from his mouth in blooms. Master, please, I cannot hear you. Zawa steadies him by the shoulders, but Ixapilo's cough only worsens. Dust pours from his lips by the mouthful. Answer me! Zawa's hands tighten around Ixapilo's frail body. He shakes Ixapilo, but the coughing continues. He shakes him again, and in Zawa's hands, Ixapilo turns to dust. It scatters instantly to the winds. Zawa looks at the dust in his hands, holding them cupped as if to preserve some vital piece of his master's wisdom. Despite his best efforts, the winds carry off the remains, leaving him with nothing. He frowns. Even after his death, I would always, I o- have always felt that when the time was right, Ixapila would find a way to teach me his secret. And yet here we are on his trail, and his knowledge is no less a mystery to me. Is this what I am meant to see? That his teachings will always be beyond me? We aren't done here yet. There is more to the Khan than Ixapilo's teachings. You speak truly, but his knowledge is the difference between a free to Khan and an enslaved one. Zawa cannot help but seek it. Sorry, I was just making sure there was enough space on my drive to not lose this fucking video, because that would be a goddamn tragedy at this point. As long as it's run, and through such significant events... Are we still looking for something? What are we still looking for? What are we still looking for? Circumnavigate the space. Um. Can't leave. The stack of bodies. Nothing there. Down here. No. Um. Where is Secrets of the Takan? Search for and pursue the White Lion. Spirit Antelope. An antelope stands gingerly on the muddy grass. Its fur is matted and stained dark around a deep oozing gash on its left haunch. Have you come here to eat me? We are not here to eat you, but you are easy prey. Is there nowhere you can hide? The beasts of this place would catch my scent. I would get none and get far. But there may be a way I can be protected. A great tree grows to the north whose sap has an odor that is repellent to predators. If you could draw this sap and rub it into my coat, I would be safe. I could heal and return to my herd. Terence, you heal this animal. I cannot heal this beast. I could heal this beast watcher, but not in the way the monk would want. I would ask neither kind of healing, as neither is any lesson to offer. Keep to your own trial, Durance, and I will keep to mine. Oh, I wouldn't dream of interfering. I await the sound of broken bonds or a broken back. There is music to both if you listen for it. Where is this tree? To the north, beside a cave. You will not find a larger in the forest. Galloween, speed your steps. Um, there's the tree. Got the repellent tree sap. Oh no, we are too late. The wolves have come. It was a mistake to leave the animal here unprotected. We ought to have protected it a while longer. We should not have left it. Did what we thought would give it the greatest chance of survival. This is difficult to accept. In my heart, it feels as though there was more we could have done. In the end, though, the wolves would have come. They can smell weakness from great distances. 
He may be bound for failure from the start. An unusually tall man with brown leathery skin and regal carriage bows to Zawa. Chieftain Ohelia, why are you here? I have come on behalf of the catch model to pay you tribute, Grave Chieftain. Tendons bulge to the side of Zawa's neck and his fists are clenched. For the first time since we met him, he appears on the brink of losing control. He speaks through gritted teeth. You have come to see if I am ready to protect my people. The catch model chieftain smiles, baring glistening teeth. Well, are you? Just laser everybody's brain. Zawa contemplates the body of his enemy. When Catch Model Chieftain saw me, he knew I was not prepared to resist him. If I'd been more convincing, I've always believed they would not have attacked. You could have mastered Ixipilo's teachings. They might have left you alone. Agreed a better deception. It's impossible to know. They'd have come for you sooner or later. He nods. Zawa sees this now. This was the life of the Takan. We lived knowing that one day the wolves would come. And finally the day came when we were wounded and could not escape them. Zawa shakes his head and smiles bitterly. I have been caught in a snare, worrying over things that could not be changed. These visions shame me with their truths. Ixipilo never warned me of this, but I should have seen it sooner. I have become a slave to knowledge I will never learn. I have denied all my failures, yet I feel no different, no freer than I was. There is something I am missing, even now. Explore the island. That may hold our answer. You must come with me at once. Zawa, you should not be here. If you are caught, they will execute you, and they will not fail twice. I do not care about my life, Nawaltia. I've come to liberate the Takan. We will unite and revolt. And who will you unite? Our men are dead or broken. Their labors were too cruel. Our women are mothers to catch model children now. The Takan live only in your mind. Zawa stands in silence, staring where the apparitions have been. That really happened. Some years ago, Zawa considered that he might never learn Exapilo's secret. But he had vowed to return to his people, and so he did. He journeyed to catch model, and while their warriors were off raiding, he spoke to the surviving Takan he found there. What was that really about? An argument Zawa had with someone once. Nothing came of it. Who was that woman? She was an Abbasca warrior, eldest daughter of the shaman. She was, would have been, wife of the Takan chieftain. The Takan had not fallen. He never told me. For once Zawa seems unable to meet our gaze. Zawa has never spoken of it to anyone. His face is tense, his skin lacking its usual smoothness. He looks old. He waited too long in returning. There was a time to liberate his people that passed long ago while he searched for the secret of the Anatlay. Why did you continue to search if you knew you'd failed? There had to be something you could have done. Why'd you continue to search? He's quiet for a moment. Ixipilo's knowledge was the one last thing of Takan that might have been recovered. But I see now that I was caught in a snare. The gem, the antelope, the waterfall. The lessons were not about Ixipilo's secrets. They were about my vow to return to the Takan. He is quiet again. His eyes search the ground, then seem to fix on something. We look down, but see only a small worm burrowing in the earth near his feet. He stares in that direction for a time, then slowly looks up at us. The time of my people has ended. There is nothing more I can do for them. The Takan lived their time and made their mark on the world. They need nothing more from you. They were a great and inspiring people. It was a gift to have been one of them, to learn from them, to walk among them. Zawa looks around and smiles flatly. The dream fades around us. I believe it is time to return. The brilliant colors around us seem to dull. Shifting objects settle into their true forms. Zawa appears the same as he always has, the same shredded skin, the same fluid posture. Only the look in his eyes has changed. Zawa was granted on Italy. Duality of mortal presence. 
Time to play, plus 10% attack speed. Anything to say for yourself? Seem different. Oh? Have you been into my Malkachoa pouches? He smiles. In some ways, I am much the same as I was. My people ended, and I could not help them. This will always color my thoughts. Yet in all my years of searching, there was something I had not allowed myself. And what's that? When the Nampaska dies, the body is laid in a pit. All who knew him took turns dropping worms into the pit with the body. We do it to learn to embrace death, but also to speed him on to his next life. It is our way of saying farewell. Tradition says that if we do not do this, the deceased warrior's spirit remains trapped in the body. Though it is tempting to keep his spirit to ourselves, we fail him if we do not let him pass on. In the Malkachoa vision we shared, I saw that all the Takan was in that pit now, and I was the only one left who could cast the worms. They were waiting on Zawa. You say Zawa is different, and I believe I am in this one way. I am different because I have cast the worms. It was with your guidance that I came to do this, and I will continue to walk your path until I have returned the favor. Good. Excellent. I believe we are done with these uh, companions at this point. Anything else to say, Lada? Better company than Galvino. About the secrets of the dwarves, perhaps? Those villagers want to fix up their broken down stuff. I hope to find. I didn't see anything like that in Turgon's battery. I know, it was just a passing fancy. She turns away, her essence buzzing with agitation. Sorry. I'd hope we might find something to put you at, at eat in some way there. Um, oh, we're not done in this area. We are not done in this area. The girl was here, right? Is she in the cave? Oh, uh-oh. Here's some fucked up ice blight. Wow. Knock that dog effect down for 20 seconds, please. Whew. When's the last time we lost two companions in one encounter? How long has it been? Well, I hope the girl wasn't hanging out here. That was just a random fucking encounter? Didn't have any bearing on anything? Sure. Um... Well, are those the standing stones? Oh, here's the avalanche site. This must be where the ice blight is. Yeah, this is where the big old blight's waiting. Give me the chain quilla for me, for myself. It amuses me to steal her. Oh, he shattered that poor blight. Less impressive than the Lagafaths. Done. Hey, fancy boots, plus three lore, plus four dexterity, plus four, plus four dexterity, four. It's the fastest, the fastest you could be. Get the plus three dex to Adair. Got a fancy hammer now. Deflection plus nine, does he have two different deflection plus nine pieces on? He does. That's wasteful. 
Give the other deflection plus nine to Durance. What are you using right now? One of these is a second chance ring. Can't give that up. Deflection plus five is good. Deflection plus nine is better. Straightforwardly. Um. So where is the girl, though? I'm ready to... Oh, something happening. Something happening, anyway. But it's not the girl. Oh, white stone looter is... So those trolls genuinely did wheel out a spore into the middle of the road here. <laughs> sure, why not? Maybe she's in the cave. Maybe she's in the cave. Oof, those loads take a long time. Oh, yep, surrounded by Wichts. That's not good. And Little Tooth. And the fox from the farmer did run and leap, run and leap. Oh, what did the poor little... They did to those poor little sheep. Despite the girls singing, the wicks around her are strangely calm. They scratch their claws in the dirt, bloodshot eyes half close, while the girl sings and hums her song. Suddenly she looks up and notices us. She looks around the cave as if hoping we're here for someone else. I'm Mila. These are my friends. Did you come to play with us? Your father misses you. She stops and thinks about this. Her lower lip wobbles. I went to see Papa and Mother got mad. I don't want Papa to get in trouble. You like sweets? How about a raw Thai cookie? A real raw Thai cookie? I've heard of those. Her eyes are wide with wonder. Can I really have one? If I give you this cookie, will you go home to your mother? She nods. Give her the cookie. The wichts begin to follow her out, but as they leave the cave, they're distracted by the sights and sounds of animals in the wilderness. One by one, they slink off to the hunt. That's good, because we are going to restore the souls to the use of the deerwood, and that might include restoring living wichts. Though I'd hate to slaughter a bunch of fucking wichts, because they might be fine in like 15 fucking minutes if I can just avoid having to murder them all. Alright. Um, we got a bounty to deal with down here. Somewhere. Looks like these. No, no, no. F3, please. What if I stunned you for a quarter of an hour? Nobody likes an unstoppable cipher. Give me the head and the bag. All right, now we gotta bless this hammer and then we will be done. We will be fucking done, I believe. We still haven't talked to the mayor. First fires, right? Oh, hey, we got ambushed by assassin. We're still trying. Come on. Here we go. This is the shrine, right? Touch. Bless Masca's Forge Hammer. We place Masca's Forge Hammer at the base of the shrine. For a moment, nothing happens. Then we hear the distant ring of hammers striking anvils. Tens, then hundreds, then thousands, all in unison. Masca's Forge Hammer suddenly flares with light, and the chorus of hammering fades away. We retrieve the hammer, and though its appearance hasn't changed, it feels heavier somehow. Well, we were trying to encourage the, um, the dozens to work with the Crucible Knights, but it seems that that's not what happened. Everybody in here is talking about how the dozens went too far and killed a bunch of them, so we may be getting an ending, but it's not the ending we wanted. So it goes. And here's the Shrine of Magrin. Whoa! Grammarfell the Wayfarer, a motley gathering, stands at the crossroads. At first glance, the person at the head of the group seems more monster than man. Two large and curling horns emerge from the sides of his skull, forming a hardened carapace that is pocked like coral. Down its center, the strange shell splits, revealing the ash-gray skin of a man's face obscured above the nose. The horns might seem a mere helmet, save that in several places you cannot tell where the flesh ends and the bone begins. From the neck down, however, this is by all appearances a human man, clad in fine armor of the same dark shade as his features. 
The man smiles, revealing long white teeth from which gums have retracted. Despite his masked eyes, he looks unerringly in our direction. Hail, traveler, and well met. He laughs quietly. Are you enjoying the fresh air? We are doing much the same. You seemed well armed for scholars. Ah, we are not scriveners or aspiring priests, but rather scholars of death. We're better to witness it than the road. These paths are not very safe. For instance, I have heard tell that there are certain groups comprised of individuals both skilled and handsome who, depending upon the monetary fortunes of strangers, will unseam these poor devils from nose to knave and thereby send them into the next life. I think our talk is done. Kill that one slow. I want to see the light leave him. Um, not gonna go well for you fuckos. Get on the ground. Get in the ground. Into the earth with you. Goodbye. Wait, you won the day. Mercy, traveler, I beg you. Fine, you'll spend some time in the dungeons at Cat Nua. As you wish it then. Enjoy! You'll be there forever until a statue busts the entire place to hell. Magran. Place Maska's forge hammer on the shrine. The temperature around us begins to rise, and before long we feel as if we're standing in front of an open forge. Her hammer begins to glow red hot. Suddenly the ground near the shrine erupts into cones of living fire. Flame lights. In the sky, winged shapes dive toward us, smoke trailing from their wide open jaws. Wow, this would have killed the shit out of her had she done this herself. I'm glad she didn't. On the ground, boys, forever. Got it. Blessed are we, I hope. Can we confirm that? Iron and flame. Yep, return. Sweet. Time to go back. Hey, he wants to sell us rhyme cutter. Oh, wait, did it say he was beset by bandits and didn't arrive or something? Iduran, have you come to trade? Hey, Tarfus. We saved the world. How's Star Wars doing? No comment on the saving the world thing. Oh, well. Andra, bless you. My meal is back. And that girl's not leaving my sight for a week. Yeah, make it a full week. I'm sorry for all the trouble I caused. Thank you for bringing me home. I promise not to wander off ever again. No need for that. You keep it. Thank you, mister. She pockets the grubby coins and not looking at us. When Royce glances away to exchange pleasantries with someone else, Maya looks at us shyly and whispers, Thank you for not killing my friends. I found a bubble hat back in the woods by the roots that look like dragon tails. I put it on. I tried to put it on, but it was too heavy. But you can have it if you want it. It's still here by the roots. A bubble hat. There by the roots. Grieving Mother returns with five mossy rocks. Yes, summon Swamp Lurker. I love mossy rocks. Um, back to Abaddon's temple. Maska, hand over the forge hammer. You could have warned me about the flame blights and drakes. The what now? Nothing in the ritual mentioned any of that. Maybe they just happen to be in the area. Here's your hammer. If it summons anything else, it's your problem. Just in time, too. I was supposed to be done with this sword yesterday. Okay, magic hammer, do your thing. Watch. She swings the hammer down hard, and both blade and anvil ring with the force of the blow. The blade's metal ripples like liquid as it shapes itself into a proper sword. She grins and nods at us, but the ringing continues, becoming more and more shrill. Just as the sound becomes unbearable, the sword shatters, scattering metal shards around the room. Hmm, Talfir's ritual. I haven't seen anyone try to use it in some time. You had help, of course, but it doesn't change the fact that you were the instigator, Maska. Is there any reason I shouldn't immediately cast you out of the temple? I... No, Master. What about you? 
You made yourself a part of this. Anything you wish to say in her defense? Lord Two. All errors can be reforged into lessons. One of Abaddon's affirmations, if I'm not mistaken. A valuable lesson for Mosca, wouldn't you agree? Would that more of my acolytes actually read the book? Ingram smiles. Masca, this stranger has preserved your position within the temple. See that his effort was not in vain. I won't. Thank you. And thank you for getting me a second chance. Here, a gift from you. One of the first things I forged. Now I need to get back to work. I've still got a lot to learn. One of these days I'll be as good as Ingram. Um, that's a dagger that she gave us, a soulbound one, and it can go all the way up to the same level that Abaddon's hammer is. It's the only other thing that can in the game. The terror of White Sword Hollow has been dealt with. Good to know that one's been taken care of. A shame we lost all those people, but at least we'll finally get some workers up there to clear out the avalanche. Here's the reward. Get a collect on road with Bounty. That's a relief. Even if they weren't headed for Stalwart, I didn't want to take the chance. Here's your reward. And some new reports come in. Group of Lagafeth. Oof. I don't, I'm tired of this shit. I, nobody cares if I do this or don't do it. I'm not going to do them. I am, however, before we ride, before we uh, walk away, going to take a shot at the dragon. The morning circle. Cloak of comfort and morning gloves. Uh, we might not have time for this anymore. We probably should send someone who we don't care about. We'll never see what the morning gloves were now. Oh well. Think we can just blitz down the dragon? What do you think? think? We can do it? I think we can do it. Okay. Because our first encounter with the dragon just went so fucking well. It was so smooth. Um, we got a lot of melee. You got a lot of melee. The devil is not one of them, though. Oops. What have we done? Reckless assault. A lot of guys who can't be knocked down here, too, which is a huge shame. Best defense of anyone in the web. That's pretty cool, but I don't know. Not like that. Barely injured. Not what I like. Oh boy. Town goes a dare instantly. Instantly. Immune to stun. Barely injured. Oh, Lord. Hmm. Okay, okay. What if we did this differently? What if we did it? Also, why have you two swap places? We did it starting over here. What if we did deal with the others first? What if I did paralyze this motherfucker. Oh, that didn't work. Got it to injured, but our team's not doing very well either. <laughs> there goes. Where's our boy? Oh wow, I might just burn it down. It's near death. Kill it, kill it, kill it. Kill it, kill it, kill it. You gods! You just need one more attack!
No, kill it! Fuck, wasn't good enough. Um... <laughs> we burned it down. Fear nothing. Fear nothing. What's happening? What did that do? Dragon meat. Delicious. Dragon meat is considered a rare and exotic treat. For a fairly obvious reason, it is not very easy to obtain. Many tales and rites of passage are formed upon the idea of consuming the raw flesh of these beasts. And primal water. Why did it glow like that? Well, it was basically a scourge upon the earth, considering it had to go kill any of its soul twins that uh, it found in the world. Now its soul is free, and such a burden is, is uh, lifted. Can't believe we pulled that shit off. Wow. Hyper indestructible protagonist, Annihilation. What is Annihilation? Is this another case of something apparently having a spell striking, confuse Annihilation to exceptional? I don't see Annihilation on here. Is this, yeah, it's like it's backwards again. Withdrawal, diamond, and some cash. For that, we slaughtered an ancient beast. But you know what? We did slaughter that beast, didn't we? Alpine dragon? Full-grown dragon is colossal. Only dragons can mate. Yeah, same one as the other one. Well, we did it. And that is a perfect place for us to wrap this. When next we meet, we'll be doing console hout, which I think might be pretty quick, depending on... I mean, we're going to be very strong for it. And uh, after console hop, we will wrap things. See you soon.